live the life you love. All right, man, we did it. 100 episodes. Look at this. Cheers to episode 100. Somehow, somehow <laughs> we did it. Yeah, man. What, what, a, what a fun ride. Mm -hmm. It's been exciting mm -hmm. to do 100 episodes. And the guest today, so my, my lovely wife, Alicia, had this idea that the 100 guest should be me. I've been, you know, I've been looking for all these ideas of who the next great guest could be and have to be someone big for episode 100. And she was like, hey, you're doing the Making It Academy now, and you've done a couple of lectures on the podcast, but nobody really knows who you are. And I hate being interviewed, but I guess the only good way to do it is uh, one of my best friends. And who better than the person that <laughs> produces the podcast? I might as well, being I already know the, uh, the content. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that easy. Well, we know each other um, too. So, <clears throat> a little bit. It kind of helps out uh, when it comes to, uh, what's that word, chemistry? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but man, hi, how are you? How are you? Hold shirt for this one. Oh, you got it. Well, look, <laughs> so I'm drinking a, uh, how Louisiana is this shit. This is new Orleans as hell right here. Little homemade bloody Mary action for you guys. And, uh, out of my Hanson's snow blizz cup. <laughs> and it's not a snow cone. It's a snowball. We exactly. use, snow, we don't use snow cones in Louisiana. We don't nope. know what that is. It's a, it's a big cone. Difference. Yep. At least cone. will argue that there is a big difference. Between Damn right. <laughs> and, um, now, what, what, are you, what are you drinking, by the way? Just drinking some, some Kona, Kona beer, Kona lager. Florida brewery, huh? No, Kona's from Hawaii. Well, I know that, but Kona brewery, is it from Hawaii or is it local? No, it's from, from Hawaii. Oh, they're from Hawaii. Hawaii. Okay, okay. That's what I meant. Yeah. Um, what was I thinking? Is Grayton, Grayton Beach, don't they have a uh, – or Grayton, Florida? Grayton Beach, Florida has a, a brew. Yeah. Most, Look most for it. Most little beach towns in Florida these days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look for it. It's pretty good if you can find it. Stuff. Good stuff. Um, so the first thing I wanted to ask you is um, how's quarantine? Interesting. Um, lots of ups and downs. You know, I've had a, a lot of extra time, obviously. So I mean, that's helped launch the Making an Academy, um, diving in more into doing some extra content for the podcast, bringing the podcast back up two days uh, a month instead of just one day a month. So that part has been great. Uh, work with AEG has been a little slow. There's not much to do with all the concerts canceled. Yeah. And then, you know, like being cooped up at the house all day, not really being able to go out. Uh, I mentioned on the podcast before, like I've had periods where, you know, battling with a little bit of a depression or just sure. being hard on myself. And that, that creeps up sometimes during downtime. So it's making sure that I allow myself to, to feel those things, but then get right back on, on the horse yeah. and be productive. It's, um, the toughest thing with the whole anxiety slash depression stuff right now is we're cooped up. We don't know what we have. Don't have a lot of places to go. Um, right. Most people are just going out for walks and jogs in their neighborhoods. And even sometimes that's too crowded. Right. Um, like I know when I go jog um, right here by nearby Lake Pontchartrain, it's full of people, like mm -hmm. way too many people of all ages too. Like everybody's out there. Yeah. Um, so it's one of those like, well, stay away, go walk in the neighborhoods and stuff like that. Right. And the worst thing too is <clears throat> no matter how many hobbies you have, it's, it's easy to get bored with them pretty quickly Yeah, <laughs> because you're, you're relying on them to do right. them all the time. And right. it gets tough, man. But um, luckily with stuff like this, we get to shoot the shit and just, you know, have some good conversations and maybe yeah. block it out a little bit. Yeah. Cause it's been um, using zoom for the podcast and yeah. for meetings or catching with friends has been, has been great. Cause yeah, it's been, it's been good. You see, you see a real person in front of you versus just like speaking on the phone i know i know it's really weird uh but you know it's ma it's making me think that this is gonna be re this was normal before covid like people just right. chatting on but it's gonna be the real norm like after this i'm pretty we, sure yeah, it's normal, gonna yeah. be well it's funny because uh alicia and her family they were like once a week all her sisters and her mom are getting on a call like a zoom call and just four you know four of them with the sisters so she has three sisters and they're like man, this is so much fun. Like, and they all live in different places. Like one's in yeah. Colorado, uh, South Louisiana and Baton Rouge. Mm -hmm. She's here in Orlando. So it's like, this is so fun that they all get to talk together and see each other and connect. It's like, why have we been doing this all the time? Like, it's, sure. Why did it take a, a virus and us being quarantined? It, that's so always the case though. Connect together, right? Yeah. <laughs> so hopefully that's it always that stays around. Yes. It always takes something shitty to happen for you to go, how are you? <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah a death or somebody. Hey man, how are you? You know, it, it's what it always takes, unfortunately, but yeah, we just get so busy. In yeah. Day-to-day -day work and our grind that we're in. 
and especially you know the music industry we're always hustling in the entertainment in general in general we're yeah. always hustling, hustling and grinding and working way too many hours which yeah. is something i hope changes in our industry as well so <clears throat> when did you find out from aeg that you guys were shutting down or postponing let's say it was about mid-march i had a show uh i think it was march 19th or 20th i had a show mm -hmm. and i found about i found out two days before that show that we're we're not going to have the show and we're postponing it and we're going to postpone everything in march and then that turned into postponing or canceling everything in april which has now pushed back until may and right now we have a few shows on the books for june mm -hmm. but it's looking like those are going to get pushed back to it's, look, it's looking like i don't know because all direct tips are protecting are going around like everyone's thinking maybe the fall of this mm -hmm. year is when we can start back up Let's hope and then there's some saying it's gonna be fall of next year uh which i think is going to cripple a lot of businesses mm -hmm. and venues if we wait that long so praying it's this year because uh, the longer we go like all the smaller venues or the venues that don't have their finances in order which had like a tough year last year are shutting down they can't yeah. get through it so yeah hopefully it's not too long and, then, and the thing too is the smaller venues are gonna start first like first you're gonna see the small clubs opening back up to a quarter capacity and then they're going to kind of set the example of what the bigger mm -hmm. venues can do makes sense you're going to start with smaller venues smaller clubs and then hopefully eventually say six months to a year you can finally start thinking festivals again hopefully yeah hopefully hopefully but so <clears throat> with your current because your status with aeg you're you're a tour manager all over the, the florida coast right or a production manager florida. production yeah. manager so all over the southeast which is mostly florida so it's for the southeast office yeah. but i do cover shows in, in georgia the carolinas and uh Mo in alabama mobile alabama yeah. yeah um so with all that shut down what are your duties at home because you are you're still working from home yeah i mean whatever there is to do from home right now um some of the shows are actually canceled so shows i was scheduled to work i'm still doing the settlements uh for those shows mm -hmm. so like money was spent on marketing for the shows so i need to go um you know it depends on what the relationship with the venue is too if we're doing a co-promotion where the venue is taking half the risk then um the venue has to basically send us half of the check or half the money that yeah. we spent on marketing already which is really tough because you know shows not happening and we spent five grand on marketing we're doing a 50 50. uh you need to send me a 25 dollars check because we spent five grand on marketing yeah uh, so it's a you know tough conversation to have uh, but all the venues obviously get it um mm -hmm. sometimes it's the other way around where we already venues money because they spent more money on marketing uh so that's my only real expense there is is figuring out um the marketing settlement who owes who what mm -hmm. and then uh outside of that just updating files and documents reaching out to all of our venues and vendors uh making sure because you know they're like doing the same thing they're getting organized and cleaning things up so as they're doing that we're trying to figure out are there new uh tech packs or tech information for shows uh are there new contacts uh, kind of just saying hello, see how they're doing. Mm. Uh, so it's kind of what we're doing now. Just trying to just find something to keep us busy. Yeah. yeah. I've always wondered because, I mean, in my mind, I was like, what, what the, what, what's in Chris's emails right now? Hey, it's postponed. Catch you in a few months. Or <laughs> yeah. that's because in my head, I'm like, well, eh, hey, sorry, guys, it's canceled. The venue knows. The artists obviously know. Yeah. And to my mind, it's like, well, I guess we'll see you in a few months, maybe. Keep in touch. Yeah. Yeah. Almost once our shows are postponed kind of indefinitely, like, yeah. you know, it's like seeing a few months or see you next year. If they yeah. see you at all, unless shows shows just get canceled completely. Yeah. And then the Which other thing is once yeah. these shows start back up, like we can't have like, so the fall is usually really busy. Like from October till about December is like a really busy time for touring and spring, like right now will be canceled. March, April is pretty busy as well. So, you can't add all those tours right on top of what normally goes out in the fall because it's going to be way too many shows, way too much content. Yeah. And what kind of money are people going to have? Like an artist that usually sells a ticket for 40 bucks, like, can they ask a $40 ticket in the fall of this year with millions of people having lost their jobs and having lost income? Or is that artist going to now have to drop their ticket to 20 bucks? And what does that mean to their guarantees? If Taking a hit. Be, yeah. They're only yeah. getting 25 grand a show or 50 grand a show. Um, they're going to need to play for half too. If their ticket prices are falling in half. So it's, yeah. it's going to be interesting. Every industry is going to have to probably just rethink things. Mm -hmm. You know, if the, the way I look at it, if an entertainment industry is thinking, I don't know, I'm just throw out a number. 
if a if an entertainment company is thinking eight, they might have to really start thinking about maybe six, five right. instead of you know, and hopefully yeah. build things back up. Um, the other thing I always preach too sucks. to venues and promoters and artists, you know, if your like if your business model solely relies on like a live audience, that's mm-hmm. kind of a dangerous business model because when a virus comes around, which nobody thought of, who knew? Um, yeah, the entire business is shut down. So you got to have alternative revenue stream. You can't rely just on live events. There's got to be other things that are bringing in revenue for your promoters, for your uh, venues, for the artists. For the artists, it's a little bit easier because they have multiple revenue streams. But the promoters and venues don't. And it's like how many promoters and venues are now going to shut down because that's their business model? Mm-hmm. Um, and what did, what's that going to look like when this is all over? Well, how about this? Because <clears throat> we're seeing this with a lot of different entertainment uh, entertainment companies. Could would bands want to do say an empty club concert and just just for streaming purposes uh i think so for those clubs that have the capability because um there's a a buddy of mine that i'm gonna have on the podcast soon but they turned um yeah the beauty of doing these these zoom things is i can share stuff yeah yeah, please do at least for the people on video learn Uh, me (laughs) i can can, so to the benefit of looking at this on video is you can see what's on my screen. Mm-hmm. The benefit of listening to the audio version is that Jason's going to clean this up and edit it and make it sound really amazing. So <laughs> both versions are going to have their benefits. They're going to be very different. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see my, my screen here, right? Sure. Yeah, I got you. So my buddy started this uh, oh, there contact we go. concert series, and they took this this warehouse and uh, turned it into a venue. I mean, it oh, looks tight. awesome. Uh, so you have a really professional stage, nice production. Yep. Great um, sound booth. You got your lighting right there to the left. Yep. So we got a yep. uh, you know, beautiful SC48 console. Yep. Uh, or actually, this looks like a Soundcraft console. Uh, nice lighting board. So it's a really professional production, right? So it's yeah. cool that all these artists are able to do like a live concert from their living room or from their bedroom or mm-hmm. from their home studio, whatever it is. And I'm, I encourage artists that they should be doing that. But you should also be able to figure out another thing you can offer to your fans. So the way I teach it, uh, artists should only be doing those live streams of 15 to 20 minutes mm-hmm. and then uh, save the longer shows, the longer sets for something a little bit more special where maybe you get subscription audience, subscription. Yeah. Where you get your audience to pay for that. Right. Um, so that's where something like this can come in and it's cool. Cause they're, you know, they've raised a few thousand dollars for each show and then they, uh, they pay the workers that work the yeah. show. Uh, and then the, the rest goes to the artists. So the artists have a way to make money and the people from the venue that usually work the shows, have a way to make money too and what's cool about this is they clean so there's like you know a drum kit and mm-hmm. a bass rig a guitar rig uh for those you can see it but i'm trying to describe it as well but they clean everything um before and after every show so everything gets disinfected everything's clean you can't bring in your own gear or backline oh, you have to use what's in-house yeah. you can't bring in your crew because they have to try to keep it under 10 people yeah. um but then you have these really cool beautiful like live stream concerts uh from like something that's an actual venue versus like just another bedroom show or living room mm-hmm. show uh, and so on so i think that's it's really cool and i feel like that's there's definitely a space for that yeah and i think that's something that venues could do as well to maybe have a little bit of a better production uh in their own venues and have someone what um <clears throat> what made me think of that was uh because i was watching radiohead's been uploading a lot of um live concerts lately mm-hmm. so i've been watching some of theirs and there were some that were the camera was framed to where you couldn't see the front of the stage where you couldn't see the crowd. It was just right up in the stage. Right. And I was like, Oh, well that's perfect. If bands need to record and stream from a venue, they can still have a show right. with a full production and just have a cropped, a crop view. And there you go. Just streaming. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So that is more, pretty cool. So much more production value doing something like that. Yeah. Now, how do you think that would affect you as a manager? As a, as a manager, it wouldn't affect you at all. Cause the manager works for the artist. So right, right. Well, I'm sorry, for your job. For my job? Yes. Uh, completely, right? Because it's not AEG or Live Nation putting these concerts on. It's the venues doing the themselves. venues. Yeah. So, like, and that's the one big problem. Like, when it comes to promoter, you know, have to throw uh, us or other promoters under the bus. But the most important thing, if you're a promoter in the business, you got to have assets. And assets are owning venues having exclusivity to venues, Mm -hmm. owning festivals, um, whatever. You got to own property, Um, whether it's intellectual property, whether it's 
um, a festival or a, a, a building where you have shows, because if you don't own any of that uh, and you're just promoting shows, like literally your 100% of your income is relying on shows, you have no assets. So if your shows disappear, you can fold up shop and yeah. you're done as a promoter. So it's a dangerous uh, to play to have no assets. I miss crowds. <laughs> yeah, I miss them. Yeah. What's the uh, what's the uh, what's the largest capacity concert you've ever worked for? Not a festival. Uh, just a venue, regular venue. Yeah, yeah. Um, I did a, a Barry Manilow show at Amway Center. Nice. Uh, it's where the Orlando Ma- Magic play, so that's old. Yeah. Seventeen thousand five hundred. Oh, good. So yeah, a little arena shows. I did that, and then a couple like smaller college arenas. But uh, mm-hmm. I guess the Barry Manilow was the largest capacity uh, venue that I've done a show at. What was your first concert? First concert I went to. My first concert yeah. at work. Uh, both. Both. Uh, first concert I went to was Guns N' Roses at the Frankfurt Soccer Stadium in Germany. Oh, yeah. That was <laughs> for the Use Your Illusion 2 in 1993. Nice. Um, Use Your Illusion Tour. I think it was that suite. Uh, in 93. And the opener was Brian May from Queen. Uh, oh, interesting. And they did a, a Queen set, basically. Yeah, uh, yeah. It was the original band. All the original band from, from Queen plus some extra players. And that was my first concert, and that's what got me hooked. And then first concert I ever worked, um, didn't finish. Should have been Rock for Hunger, right? Because I that's kind of how I got into this. Yeah, yeah. But um, always dreaming big and being super ambitious. I was like, hey, this festival is coming together really well, and people are excited about it. Let's start doing some pre-shows and some pre-parties. So oh, technically, nice. the the pre-concert to the big festival that I did yeah, is yeah. the first original concert, and it wasn't just. Um, by the student union at UCF, it was an outdoor show, so we had to, had to get these uh, 10 by 10 tents to cover the stage mm-hmm. in case it rained. Um, and you know, they're like, please don't like have it too loud because like we're nervous <laughs> to have like full on bands. Like I like, had like hard rock and metal bands. Hold on, I okay. guarantee you, the person that told you that did don't they did this a bit? Don't put it too loud. Yeah, what's it too loud? <laughs> don't don't don't. They always <laughs> animate. Like what? Yeah. <laughs> what is this in decibels? What is this? I know. What does it mean? I don't know what this is in decibels, man. I'm like, please don't put it too loud. <laughs> yeah, don't. <laughs> it's fucking weird. But you no, know, it's awesome. That was like a full on hard rock show right in front of the, the student union at UCF and yeah, make a lot like, of noise. It was, it was fun. That was technically uh, the first concert. We had two bands playing up there. Is uh G and R is your fa- are they your favorite brand? I thought Metallica was your favorite band. Uh I go through phases. Um okay. so all time favorite would be Guns N' Roses, Foo Foo Fighters, Metallica. Those are like my three mm. all time favorites. But the funny thing is I don't listen to like newer bands that sound similar. My mm-hmm. taste in music has gone a lot more soul, R&B, funk, uh, that New Orleans sound. Sure. Um, I mean, maybe part of it's living in New Orleans and now really missing it. But, you know, like Leon Bridges is like one of my favorite artists right now. Uh, or any, like pretty much anything from New Orleans, like Trumbone Shorty, John yeah. Cleary. Uh, I just love that that sound. So just love having a piano in there. I love having a couple of horns in there. Just... Papa Grow. Yeah, man. <laughs> Papa Grow and that Hammond. Oof. <laughs> Yeah, oh, yeah, brutal. You can do it, man. Just rips it. So I was never like a big GNR fan, but I always like appreciated their their concerts because it was just freaking lit the whole time. Like extremely. They never, good. from the very time they the first note to the very end with those oh. dudes was was absurd. That, um, that's a concert where you literally walk out. I mean, because I just saw them in uh, just a couple months ago or before yeah. it all started. You walk out and you're like, wow, I just got my ass kicked. Yeah, that's how I felt seeing Rage Against the Machine for the first time. Oh, it's a dream. I want to see well, that. Well, Rage, Rage and Prince are my top two favorite concerts ever. Nice. Um, well, my favorite but I, concert I could... ever was uh, Foo Fighters at the House of Blues. I mean, oh, no, I, oh I, I remember those shows. Because I remember those shows. Th- those are my favorite shows. Like, I saw, I saw the Coachella documentary, and I was like, you know, it'd be, I've never been to Coachella. And mm-hmm. as awesome as it would be to go to Coachella, like – Something about me is just more excited about seeing a band that's way too big for the venue they're playing. Um, so, like, you know, Foo Fighters could play arenas, mm-hmm. and they played the tiny house of blues that uh, I was working at, which holds 850 people. So seeing a band that can sell easily 20, 30,000 tickets playing in front of 850 people, dude, that energy inside the house of blues, that's my, that's my favorite show. Yeah. Ever. So you, you, got, you had the big idea going to GNR. At a foot at a soccer stadium, I'm gonna go ahead and assume that stadium holds about thirty thousand, thirty forty thousand, bigger. 
The one in Frankfurt, 60,000. Okay, wow. Yeah. I was thinking of a different stadium then. So you, so there was more than 60,000. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's my first concert. That's awesome, dude. That's amazing. <laughs> my, my first concert experience was nothing like that. What was yours? Um, New Kids on the Block. Ah, nice. Step-by-step step tour, baby. I think Alicia's first concert was uh, maybe in sync in New Kids on the Block. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I was like 10. And all I remember seeing is like these tiny little figures bouncing around on a stage, yeah. like from <laughs> way on top and just yeah. shrill shrieking the whole time <laughs> from, from women and me. <laughs> well, I mean, some in Keo TV, man. I ain't afraid to admit it. Um, something else I wanted to ask you that I had on this list concerning um, your first concerts was there ever a gap between? Because I'm going to use GNR in Frankfurt as an example. Was there ever a huge gap between, say, going to a major concert and then going to another major concert, or were you always looking for another another show to go to? Mm-hmm. As a well, young age, I guess that was that. There's gaps, right? I was young because Guns N' Roses. I was ten years old, uh, so as a ten year old, I'm not going to major concerts every month. But the next major one, pretty cool one too, um, was following year. Um, wasn't my type of music as a kid growing up, but I became definitely a fan afterwards of all these artists. So it was, uh, it was a couple of local bands that opened. Mm. Then the first headline it was a festival. The first headliner was John Zakata, then was Joe Cocker, then Tina Turner, and then Rod Stewart. That's the weirdest fucking lineup I've oh, ever such heard. Such a great, great show. It was a, a festival. You know, in Germany, they do these oh, it makes sense. summer festivals. Um, and the other interesting story at, at that festival was the first time I bought liquor. Uh, you know, 11 mm-hmm. years old. Not for me, but my dad was like, hey, can you go – uh, get me another Jim Bean with Coke. I was like, <laughs> okay, not even thinking anything of it because that's uh, you're you know, growing up in Germany. And all the guy, the, the, the tent told me, he's like, make sure your dad comes next time to grab one. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we had 11 year old kid buying Jim Bean with Cokes. <laughs> Dude, that's fantastic. <laughs> the closest thing I have to that was um, senior trip, Cancun, Mexico, of high, in high school, 17, 18 years old, whatever. We pull into the, the Cancun airport and everybody's, you know, getting out and getting their bags and everything. Mm-hmm. And there's a small little, like a little convenience store stand right by the, by the luggage pickup, by the baggage claim. And no shit, there's a kid buying like a tall boy Corona for his dad. And he hands it, mm-hmm. he hands it to the cashier and the cashier looks up and the dad's waving like, yeah, he's with me, <laughs> you know, hand over a peso and he walks over with a beer. <laughs> like, it's crazy. Exact same way that, it would never happen again. Yeah. Um, so college, I know UCF, mm-hmm. and I know you had no music major at all. No, so I'm or entertainment, to... nothing. No, I was originally um, so original original major was uh, business, which is interesting because I love business. I love you know numbers. I love building business and growing business. But um, b- studying business in college is very very different than the real world, and I yeah. hated it. Um, so I switched my major to psychology. And my second year in college, I became a personal trainer. Um, and I've been a trainer, was, was a trainer for like 10 years. And I wanted to do more with training, right? And I wasn't like the super fit Jack guy. Um, mm-hmm. I, was, I was lean, but I wasn't like the, you know, the, the jock at the gym training all the like the, the attractive people. Um, so I got all the clients that nobody wanted, which tended to be like, clients with like a lot of like issues and things you have to kind of be mindful of um train them in different ways so people with high blood pressure people with diabetes Mm. uh, i had a lady with fibromyalgia so that led me into really learning and studying how to best train those clients uh and come up with like creative ways to create exercises for them right especially the person with fibromyalgia i had a um, trainer in the pool uh so i never really knew how to do a workout in the pool but i had to learn it um that's like the best way you know people at least at that time all the research was saying the best way for those people to train is in the pool so i came up with all these uh, pool exercises and a pool program for her and she lost all this weight uh i had a lady that um was so overweight that she couldn't uh walk uh mm. like barely walk upstairs um so she would always use like the elevator to go to the cardio machines and within three months she had dropped 50 pounds and was able to go up and down the stairs um uh, for the first time in like 10 years and 
So like, you know, like it became really fun to do something for those clients, but I wanted to do more. Like I, I'm the kind of person that likes tends to get bored easily yeah. <laughs> if I oh, do the huh? same thing over and over and over again. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to do more. I was like, you know what? The way you really help these people is go to med school. So I went to UCF as a pre-med major or a non-traditional pre-med. So I was a psychology major with a pre-med track. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of my, my uh, start in college. Um, UCF. Did um, oh, it was through UCF and through, through you being a personal trainer that, that actually got your, almost your unexpected invite into, uh, into music, into the music business? Yeah, so when you're in, in pre-med, uh, so the way to really stand out for the colleges besides good grades and good MCAT score is doing something interesting that usually leans on being like doing research, like working in a lab, um, like after classes and uh, doing experiments or going more to volunteer community route. Mm-hmm. So I went to volunteer community route um, and did all kinds of different things around the community. But for some reason, like hunger and homelessness spoke the most to me and like at risk. Youth. Why was that? Um, I think because it was the most visible problem uh, in Orlando. Like you saw homeless people everywhere. You saw yeah. um, poor neighborhoods with, with kids that didn't have the same opportunities that, that anyone that's someone growing up, uh, up in a good wealthy family has. Um, they do, but it's a little more challenging, right? Um, the schools are not as good. Uh, so I was like, man, and I wasn't aware like, how much of, the, of a problem it was just in Orlando. So to learn how many thousands of um, people are homeless in Orlando and uh, kids that are like at risk, um, I wanted to do something. So I kind of got really involved in that. So we did a lot of like boys and girls clubs, a lot of after school tutoring, uh, feeding the homeless. And then I became the director of hunger and homelessness for UCF, so for volunteer UCF. And part of that is you have to put on this banquet. It's like a hunger banquet. And that's kind of how I learned about all that, like going to a previous hunger banquet from the, from the previous director. And the hunger banquet is basically like an awareness event where you have guest speakers and maybe show some cool like videos or documentary. Like kind of like try to make an impact on the students and inspire them to get more involved in their local community. Uh, and it obviously worked on me. <laughs> so that's, um, and again, I wanted to do more. So I was like, how about we do a whole hunger week and on top of the mm. hunger banquet, we kick it off with a music festival because I go to all these local shows, right? So like you asked me about gaps between concerts. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in college, there were barely any gaps. I would go to a major concert probably twice a month and uh, probably a local show every Thursday, Friday, Saturday if I wasn't going to a major concert. So I got to really got to know the local scene. And one of my clients was, like my training clients, was a person, her name's Anna Reyna. She's one of my, men- my first mentor. Um, she was managing a couple of local bands and I would start picking her brains. I traded, traded her free training for uh, music business advice. Oh, there you go. And she basically Smart. inspired me and taught me how to uh, work with, with, with bands and artists and put on concerts. And I put on my first concert and just rock for hunger. And a lot of bands I met through her or by going to local, local shows and one of her artists uh, played that first festival. What was the turnout? Uh, the first festival had almost 1,000 people. Awesome. It was, awesome, free, it was free. It was free to students. Still, it's a thousand it in, people. Yeah, it was in the student union. It was donation only, so we raised a couple thousand bucks. Hell yeah. For um, two nonprofit organizations. Yeah. Um, so the feeling of accomplishment. Mm-hmm. You go to college for something that you think you enjoy, <laughs> and then you get this opportunity, and you realize, oh, wait, this is actually what I love since you were right. a child. This is right. basically what you always wanted to do. Right. If you really think about it. So what was, what was the feeling? What was... Did, did the brain kind of widen up a little Put bit on the first concert? Brighten up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was awesome. I wanted to do more. Uh, yeah, yeah. The exciting thing, too, is like, you know, the best way sometimes to get like validity to what you're doing, like mm-hmm. that is like what you're doing is good work and you're doing a good thing, is by having your peers or people you work with uh, wanting to do more work with you, right? So if you do something mm-hmm. and you do it well, and because you did it so well, someone wants to hire you to do more, like that's a great feeling of accomplishment. So from yeah. that first festival, um, let me see, so there were six artists that played, and I ended up managing and booking shows for four out of the six. Not immediately, right out of that festival. Um, I started off with one uh, other artist, and then maybe within two months, I mm-hmm. took on a second one. And then uh, the band, so like my good friend, Greg Rollette, who's been on the podcast. Uh, episode number one. Episode number one. In the archives. 
<laughs> Download that. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, he's a marketing guru and he's great at marketing. And his band played. And he was, his was like one of the co-headliners of the festival. And he came to me very blunt um, like four months later. And he's like, dude, if you can book all these amazing shows and gigs for uh, these shitty bands, so I'm sorry to be honest with you, Chris, but if you can do that for these shitty bands, what could you do for us? And that was the first band I really managed and really developed and almost got on a tour, um, mm -hmm. on a major tour, but they broke up a week before the tour. Oh, shit. And I burned, I burned a bridge with that manager that uh, that artist I was working with because my band pulled out a week, a week before a tour. What was the lesson you learned, you learned from that, from having that, that burned bridge with the, with the manager? Mm. Was that your first experience with a manager that, that kind of soured? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. First one. What'd you um, learn from it? The lesson learned is I know, just being more aware of your band. Um, it's, it's tough to like send, you know, four guys with barely any money in a van um, to not make any money to maybe even come back in the red. Um, stuff like stuff sending anyone out on the road like that right mm -hmm. um so i think the lesson learned is artists should have some experience having done that and touring before other parties and other relationships are involved so don't just like if you go on a weekend run that doesn't count if you mm -hmm. go on a three-week tour up the east coast and you come back and like a headline tour like or just you know opening for local bands in those different cities and you come back and you still like each other and you still want to continue touring then it, that's a good sign that this is a band that could go on the road but mm -hmm. um so yeah i think i think that's the lesson i think the main lesson i wouldn't put a band on the road with someone else unless they've been on the road on, on their own first yeah um when you're connecting the dots here between one job to the next one opportunity to another another experience to another how long were you were you working with with bands before you ended up at uh, the Plaza Live in Orlando? Um, let me see. So I started in two thousand six uh, with Rock Fronger, mm -hmm. and we started doing Rock Fronger annually uh, every year. It became like a. But at three, uh, we had five. Five. Okay. Yeah. So Rock Fronger three um, is the one where a friend of mine. So so the second one was outdoors, and we had some challenge with all you know the elements and things that come along mm -hmm. with doing a festival outdoors. Uh, bringing in stages. Another learning fencing. lesson, right? Yeah. Bringing in stages, bringing in fencing, bringing in portal parties, parties uh, in Florida. I mean, you never know what the weather is going to be like. Yeah. So we were like, is there an indoor venue that we can go to that'll be a little bit less expensive, still can have multiple stages um, and don't have to like worry about, about the weather. And someone had suggested the Plaza Live. And I looked at the venue and I was like, well, they're only doing like community theater. They're doing a little mm -hmm. shop of horrors, the Christmas story. Um, but they had two stages, like two venues, and they had this giant lobby that you could drop another stage in. Yeah. Um, and they had a parking lot out front where you could drop more stages. I mean, anywhere I could drop a stage, I would try to figure out. How to if put there was space, in. you were dropping a stage. Yep. <laughs> so Rock Runner 3 was at the plaza, and we had four stages, one outdoor stage, a lobby stage, and one in each room. And uh, that was in 2008. So that's how I got to know the people from the plaza. The cool thing is my first meeting with them, you know, I'm going into the meeting um, trying to sell them on this event that I wanted to do at their venue. Mm -hmm. And it turned into them selling me that I should work for them and book shows for them because they saw what I was doing locally around town and they wanted to do more concerts. So Rock Runner 3 wasn't actually the first concert I booked there. Um, the first show I did there was Soja, uh, like a big reggae band, and the Supervillains, which was like a huge local reggae ska band at the time and they we did about 600 tickets and they got pretty close to close selling out of beer it's the most um beer they've ever sold at a show and they're like wow we want to do more of this uh so they kind of were paying me just commission at that time and then that uh turned in like a freelance gig into an actual full-time job mm -hmm. working for the plaza booking shows for them and that's what kind of turned the plaza into a full-time music venue at least really? that was the first steps they were still doing community theater mm -hmm. for a couple more years after but now today it's a full uh time running live music venue um and the relationship with aeg uh started uh i kind of they were already doing shows there but like one or two a year and i kind of 
help initiate the conversation to get them doing um, 10 shows a month there versus mm -hmm. just one, one or two shows a year. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And um, now I'm assuming four and five were, were pretty big successes too, right? Yeah, four we went back to. So there's a venue in Orlando called, now it's called Soundbar. Back in the day it was called Back Boots. Oh, yeah. They had like a parking lot next door. Uh, so Rock Hammer 2 and 4 were in that parking lot next to Back Booth. Uh, 4 was actually the most profitable out of all of them. Mm -hmm. um, and then 5, the last one, we did in a field across the street from the Citrus Bowl. So it's still oh, cool. it's like one of the parking lots from the Citrus Bowl that's fenced mm -hmm. in. And we did it there. Um, it was the biggest in terms of like names we had, like headliners we had on this festival. Uh, we had Keller Williams, Zach Deputy. So like not major artists but are a pretty big deal in the jam uh, band scene back then and uh that was the most money we've ever lost on a, on a rock longer festival and that's kind of what uh what killed us you mind sharing how much as a as a as a learning lesson yeah um yeah close to fourteen thousand dollars <laughs> that i paid out of my pocket um now the scariest thing is so, you know, the lesson learned is uh you should have quite a few shows under your belt uh, before you start even thinking about a festival, learning how like all the nuts and bolts and whatever it goes into putting on a festival. Um, and you should have the money. Like we put on that festival all together. It wasn't a super expensive cost, mm -hmm. close to 50 grand. Um, and I had, that's how much money I had in the bank when we put that festival on. Jesus. Zero dollars in the bank when we went on sale. That's insane, dude. <laughs> and uh, the scariest phone call I ever made is, uh, calling an agent after the festival and saying, hey, just want to give you a heads up immediately. The check I wrote for your artist might not clear. <laughs> but if it doesn't, I'm good for it. I just want you to know it might not clear. Thank God it cleared, but it put me three grand in the red at the bank. Oh, gosh. The other um, scary thing, so that's why, you know, building good positive relationships is so important. Being honest, uh, having open conversations is important, right? So, uh, I won't name the, the beer vendor, but the, the vendor that sponsored the festival uh, and paid for our stage um, and provided all the beer that we were selling. Um, after it was over, I had to go to the vendor and mm -hmm. say, and we only had to pay for cost of goods because we had our own people selling the beer. They just provided the trucks, they provided the kegs, and we had our volunteers selling it. Um, I had to go to the vendor and saying, hey, so all that beer that we sold, which was quite a ton of beer, uh, I can't pay for it. <laughs> And he's like, well, what about the sales from the beer? I'm like, we lost so much money on the show oh, God. that I had to use the sales from the beer to pay for the artists. So that was a very uncomfortable conversation. And thank God, like I was working at the plaza, uh, doing really well there. Um, and the old arena shut down and they were opening the new Amway Center where the Magic played. Um, and my, my beer rep comes to me and says, all right, I have an idea. I have these kegerators, which is like almost another blessing in disguise, right? Because at the plaza, we were very limited on bar space and how many uh, kegerators we have. So we only had like three taps. Uh, he's like, we, ha we have these kegerators. If you put your keg my kegerators in your lobby, I'll let you one, keep them, but you have to keep all my sponsorships on those kegerators for a year. Done. So wow. he waived my entire debt um, that I owed him. And we got free kegerators at the plaza and just had to keep their sponsorship logos on for a year. We ended up keeping them for, I think, two years uh, until we actually converted those kegerators into a bar. And they're still using those kegerators at the plaza That's today. That's cool. That's yeah. awesome. So, I mean, number one, you want to have communication skills when dealing with, uh, with the venues and the artists and the management and, and the agents and everybody. Right. Um, were you – because I'm trying to think. You and I met when you started working – you were at the House of Blues. You had just moved to New Orleans, but yeah, that's where we met. In between there, before before uh, leaving the Plaza and and moving here, what are some of the concerts that really stood out to you? That maybe not necessarily concerts that um, that were successful based on gates, you know, gate business, merch, or whatever. But I'm in just in terms of uh, personal satisfaction that you felt like you had done an excellent job for those for those bands and venues what were those shows um so at, at back booth which is now sound bar um when i left plaza i started booking shows there and mm -hmm. um and shows around all over the state of florida so i kind of became like a mini concert promoter um booking shows all over the state but i didn't last long it only lasted for three months because 
then I got scooped up by House of Blues. So during that three-month period was the first time of me going out really officially starting my own business, uh, which was one live concert. And uh, there's two shows that stood out. We One, we did Hinder uh, at Backbooth. So the band that could play like a 2,000-person venue uh, playing a small 300-person club. They were doing kind of like um, it's like an acoustic tour playing like clubs that they started out in. Uh, kind of just kind of, I don't know, take them back to down memory lane mm -hmm. and do some fun for the fans. So we had this massive band playing this tiny club. And when I talked to the tour manager in advance, like, hey, just so you know, we don't have all these dressing rooms and all those things that you're requesting on your rider. And the tour manager was totally cool. He was like, dude, we're playing a shitty club and we know we are. We have a bus. We're going to hang out on the bus. Don't worry about it. We're going to take care of ourselves. Um, so that was an awesome show. That, of course, sold out. And then there's a mini um, festival that the people that organized for the music fest um, did. Uh, it was like a fall festival. I don't remember the name of it. Um, it sadly, only lasts like two years. But it was like different shows at each venue. And one of the shows I got to book for that festival, another like throwback old school band. But I don't even remember the, the Flowbots. Yes. I ride my bike with no Yeah, yeah, yeah. No I remember them. Yeah, you yes. Know? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So that was a show I booked. That sold out. And that was awesome. Like they were oh, cool. such a good band. Uh, that was in 2000. What was that? Uh, 2012. Um, yeah, they were more of like they were more about they were more of a fun band. They would just kind of wanted to create more of a kind of party atmosphere oh, yeah. from what awesome. I kind of remember. Like yeah, a hip hop yeah. rock band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were they were really fun. Awesome. Um, so how long were you at the Plaza before moving to New Orleans? At oh, Plaza? and also, what I, I never actually got your story of how you even got um, got offered the job at H O B. So I was at the Plaza for four almost four and a half years, um, and then House of Blues. Um, Two years before I got the job, I actually had applied for that exact same position, um, and I didn't get it. Um, and I asked the, the guy why that was like, uh, interviewing, which was Sonny, my yeah. um, now old mentor, um, one of my favorite people I ever worked for, worked with. Um, so I asked him straight up. I was like, hey, why did I get this job? And he said, well, in New Orleans, we book a lot of hip-hop, and you don't have a lot of experience booking hip-hop shows. And... Um, you're doing a really good job at the plaza. Um, you guys have done some great shows, but it's you guys haven't like crossed over into a lot of different genres yet. And I'd like to see a little bit more of that. So from there on, I just went all out trying to book uh, bigger shows. That's what led to the relationship with, with AEG. Um, I got more aggressive with them, trying to get them to do more shows at the plaza so we can start getting bigger names under our belt. And one of the first big shows I booked on my own was this artist that at so the plaza holds 1500 at the time it held 1500 people now the capacity went actually went down uh because of some coding things but at the time it was 1500 and there was this little artist that was playing 500 person venues all over the country and selling them all out completely sold out tour um and then they were jumping up to the next level um they were asking quite a lot of money but I just had a really good gut feeling about this artist and my first big sold out hip hop show at the Plaza Live was Childish Gambino. Oh, cool. No and, shit. Um, and then for those of you guys uh, watching, let me see. For those of you watching on on YouTube, I actually have, I might have, I might have some photos I can share. Let me see. Yeah, dude, I, I didn't even know you, um, you had booked Childish Gambino way back then. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that, was my, that was my first big show that I booked. Um, How was he? Awesome. And, and mm -hmm. so nice. Um, That's what I mean. He seems like a sweetie. Yeah, he was totally down to earth. We made this plaque for him that said, like, kind of how many tickets we sold and what the gross mm -hmm. to the show was. And, you know, usually an artist uh, will turn in what's called a settlement sheet to their agent. And I don't have the photos. Uh, I'll share them on the show notes. Um, and usually those artists will send a settlement sheet to their agent, like, how many tickets were sold, what was the gross, uh, and kind of like a report. He's like, yo, forget the settlement. I'm turning this shit into my agent. <laughs> <laughs> that was really cool. And then look what happened. Poof. <laughs> oh, yeah. Dude's not, all over the not place. Not only did man. we take a giant risk. I mean, it wasn't really a risk because Charles Gambino was already doing community at the time. Mm -hmm. but he just started doing Charles Gambino. Yeah. Um, so it was a huge risk in a sense. We're offering a really big guarantee to an artist that's playing small clubs. And yeah. is that show going to sell 1,500 tickets? And it, it blew out that we sold 1,500 tickets in yeah. advance. So Gambino was um, was the booking that got you that got you the job 
in New Orleans. I, yeah, so the, I guess I'm not going to answer the question fully. So I want to know tangent story. That's why um, I'm here. <laughs> so, so, so booking, Charles Gambino, uh, we had Macklemore play, play the plaza uh, right when, when Thrift Shop came out. Um, a couple other hip hop shows, we booked some, some rock and metal shows. We started getting uh, into the pop world. We, we booked Michelle Branch um, at the plaza, who had a little bit of a resurgence at the time. And uh, Fight for Fighting was playing the plaza right when they're uh, kind of starting to blow up again. And then two years later, after I interviewed for the job, um, the job came open again. Uh, the person that had the job before me ended up leaving after two years, mm-hmm. and I reapplied. And Sonny interviewed me again. And in the interview process, I had like an entire – uh, like Starship Enterprise in front of me of notes um, and a whole page of every artist from New Orleans I ever booked. That's like one of the oh, cool. missions I went on. I wanted to book any artist from New Orleans. Uh, I didn't care how big or small. If you said you're from New Orleans, I'm booking you. Um, artists didn't know it was that easy to get into the plaza, but if you were from there, you're, you're in. <laughs> now, the copious notes that you brought, was that something you had thought to do or is that something you learned from somebody? It's something I thought to do. Um, okay. I just wanted to really – Oh, I mean, I've learned from other people they should always prepare for an interview. But you, you're an organized person already. You're very yeah. organized and yeah, yeah. So I learned to be always prepared going into an interview. And since it was a phone interview, because I was in Orlando, they were in New Orleans, um, I had all these notes in front of me. So there's an entire page of every artist from New Orleans I've ever booked, as an entire page of all the hip hop shows that I had booked. It was my resume, a list of all the competitors in New Orleans that I would be competing with, um, and like a bunch of other stuff. I had the House of Loses history of all the shows. They've booked, um, so I really know what they were doing as well. And I had like an hour long interview with, with Sonny, uh, Jim Maloney, who has been on the podcast, yeah. and uh, the, the GM of the House of Blues at the time. And uh, thankfully, I got the job and got the yeah. House of Blues. So, uh, you had never, well, obviously, you moved from, from, uh, from Germany when you were a kid to Orlando. You had never lived anywhere between Orlando and New Orleans, right? No, no, no. Okay. Uh, going to New Orleans was the first time I actually ever left home. Um, so, you know, at age, what, what was that? It was 2012. So at 30, um, yeah, yeah. was the first time I ever left my family and yeah. lived, lived on my own. I didn't, I didn't live on my own during college. Yeah. What, uh, what brought you here from Germany in the first place? Uh, my dad was in the army. Um, also kind of a fun story. So him and his buddies were out drinking one night. Uh, no way. All the fun stories start when you're out drinking, right? Of course. <laughs> so they were out drinking one night, and they got some really terrible, terrible news uh, that one of their best friends died in the Vietnam War. Um, mm. So they got really drunk and decided they were going to avenge their friend and, and go to Vietnam. And the next day, they all went to the, the Army recruiter and, and joined the Army. Whoa. And <laughs> became American citizens. So my dad's from Peru originally. Yeah, yeah. Um, so he moved to, to New York. Uh, to follow his dad, who was a musician, so that's probably where the music gene comes in. Uh, my grandpa was was a drummer, playing mm. you know Copacabana and all the legendary clubs in New York. And my dad joined the army uh, after that news, and is technically a Vietnam vet. Um, but when they once they got to Vietnam, the war was already over, mm. and they're kind of just hanging out until they knew where they're going to de- redeploy next. Then they got redeployed to Germany, uh, where he met my mom, and they. Moved back to the States once. They moved back to New York uh, and they lived in Jersey and decided that wasn't like a really good p- place to really raise a family. Mm-hmm. And my mom wanted to go back home. Um, but it kept being drawn towards like the United States coming back. Uh, so one year we went on vacation. Uh, we wanted to go to like the Disney World and the mm-hmm. Universal Studios. But so first we went to New York, uh, met my grandpa um, in Queens, is where, uh, where, where he lived. Uh, so they took me all around Queens and Manhattan and kind of showed me around New York. And then we went to Orlando on that same trip. And my parents fell in love with Orlando. Oh, look at that. Decided to, to buy a house here. <laughs> oh, look at that. But yeah. somehow you ended up in Mainz, Mainz, Mainz. Germany. Yep, that's where I was born. Isn't that cool? That's <laughs> yeah. awesome. My, uh, my, my always, I always wanted to ask you this. What are some of your memories growing up in Germany? I never asked you that. Um, growing up in Germany, let me see. School's extremely tough uh, in Germany. Um, so after four years of school, right? So, I mean, I don't know if the system's changed now. It might be different mm-hmm. these days, but basically your performance up until fourth grade, um, gets judged. And after fourth grade, you go to one of three different 
which is high school is then like fifth grade to 10th grade is technically high school over there. Um, so, but there's different levels of high school. Um, there's like the elite, um, which is called uh, back then was called gymnasium, I think. Um, Sounds like elite. the levels of a soccer academy. Yeah, <laughs> but these are the students is. that are going to be doctors, lawyers, engineers. Of course. Schools, extremely challenging. And then there was kind of the school in the middle um, where still like getting really good jobs, really smart kids. And then there's the, the tier in, on the bottom which is called the Hauptschule. Uh, and that's where most students go. Uh, doesn't mean these students are not going to be doctors and engineers. What does that mean in English, by the way? Hauptschule? Hauptschule in English. Man, that's a, that's a good thing. To oh, Google. come on. You're from Germany. You're supposed to know this. Haupt. Ask your mom. In English. Secondary school. What, what the definition <laughs> oh, okay. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> that's crazy. But that's because that's after it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Middle elementary school. So technically your middle school and high school combined. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know. Um, and yes, I went to Hauptschule in, in Oppenheim, uh, right along, along the Rhine. Wow. Oh, see that 10 times. <laughs> Hauptschule in Hoffenheim. <laughs> and, um, what was that? Going on tangent. So, so there's three different levels of schools. Yeah. Uh, I went to the lower level, uh, which is where most kids go. So I think would, I would say maybe 10% go to the elite school, another 10% go to one in the middle, and like 70 to 80% will go to, to help Chula. So it's not, not like these are the dumb kids. This is where everybody goes. Um, it's like when you have like honors classes, like honors English, honors math, that will be like the equivalent of just going to a different school for that. Okay. Um, but like all the great – Athletes, you know, come out of come out of the house. All sure, the, all the, the hustlers. <laughs> That's right. That's the right. grit. Yeah, the ones with the Dude, grit. And schools. You asked me about school in Germany. Like, uh, yeah. And then my fifth grade. That's my my last year in Germany. Um, in fifth grade, I took uh, swimming, track and field, gymnastics. That was like my uh, PE. And then in soccer, of course. And then I took chemistry, biology, physics. Oh God. Algebra, Ugh. Uh, World geography. Ugh. Well, I like world geography. I had to learn English, uh, my first second language at fifth grade. Yeah. Um, and well, thankfully, I was, you know, for my dad, I, I had the basics down. Um, and what else? We had to take German. We, you know, so instead of taking English here, we mm-hmm. uh, take German um, and theology. So like whatever. Uh, and the theology was either you're split up like either by Catholic or uh, Protestant. Um, Interesting. So yeah, so you ha- you're forced basically to go to uh, Catholic classes or Protestant classes. Um, so that was school when I left. And then and real quick on like gym, right? Um, you were graded A B C B A B C F or A B C D F um, based on how fast you run the hundred meters. <laughs> of course. Based on how long you can jump the long jump and and the shot put. You were ba- graded based on how well you could swim. <laughs> like. It was so fucking brutal <laughs> to go to school there. Uh, this explains all the World Cups that Germany has won, oh, yeah. the Olympic gold medals. It explains everything about German engineering, their music. It explains everything. Yeah, I mean, all, all of you them. Know, here in PE, I would, I would, you get an A if you like dress for PE and participate. <laughs> that is there, so I awesome. Get, I get an A if I run the 100 meters in a certain time. That is so awesome. <laughs> what a cra- God, I can't imagine that even being like a structure here. <laughs> you know it's so bizarre um so you'll move to your 100 meters <laughs> i know right oh my god you can't graduate high school because you failed in running yeah. um it's so weird dude so when y'all moved to orlando what year was that it was 94 um, 94 world cup year yes and in u.s to yeah. belgium and netherlands at the citrus bowl in orlando lucky bastard <laughs> lucky was that your first your first big soccer event oh yeah really okay yeah Never went to a Bundesliga game, so really, that's uh, oh, one of my dreams. Interesting. To go, yeah, yeah, to a that's, game pretty, that's cool though. That's pretty cool. Um, when you guys moved over, and I'm thinking of this too because uh, just pop culture wise, when you guys moved to Florida, early mid '90s, Penny Hardaway is there, right, for the Magic. Shaq is there. Shaq, Nick Anderson, Sh- yeah, Boris Nick Brandon, Anderson, Scott Skiles. Uh, man, I'm blanking his name now. 3D, Dennis Scott. Um, yeah, we got a picture and an autograph with him when I was that's awesome. Uh, Thirteen years old. Because at that team. time, that's Orlando was kind of putting themselves in the map sports wise. Yeah, because the Magic had kind of just gotten there. So we just got the World Cup. Uh, yeah, the Magic went to the finals in ninety five, ninety six. I went yeah. to see the Magic versus the Bulls. So that was my first big 
uh, basketball game in the High playoffs. School itself. Um, that that game that the Magic love to replay in every single highlight of Nick Anderson stealing the ball from Michael Jordan. Uh, I was there. Like every time you see Orlando Magic highlights, that you were there. <laughs> no, but pay attention. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, whenever you see Orlando Magic highlights, that highlight of Nick Anderson stealing the ball from Jordan is always in there. <laughs> That's one of, the, one of the few highlights they have. Of course, because <laughs> there's not too many highlights of Michael Jordan getting punked out like that. So. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't happen much. Not much. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll swing back here, back to HOB um, in a second. When, when you got to the HOB, what sort of uh, culture shock did you, did you come up on when you got to New Orleans, coming from Germany to Orlando and then mm-hmm. to here? Um, well, good things I've been to New Orleans a few times before. I kind of knew what I was getting myself into. Um, but in terms of living there, uh, big culture shock, right? Yeah. But like, not. I mean, yes. I mean, safety is a big concern, and crime is a big concern over there. But it's. I don't want to say it's worse. Like it seems worse than it actually is. Like it is bad. Um, what I always tell my students when you go to New Orleans, um, don't walk around by yourself at night. Um, don't get too drunk uh, on your on your own. Um, don't um, wander off down streets where that are kind of empty, and don't buy drugs from someone you don't know. If you don't do those four things, you're gonna avoid ninety five percent most of the crime. Yeah. Right. Yep. Um, so, but not knowing that, not having lived there, you think it's a dangerous city. So I purposely moved a little bit outside of the city um, in a town that I thought looked close on a map. Um, which is Kenner, <laughs> but driving from Kenner to downtown New Orleans every day, ooh, nope. that was a nightmare. Nope. Uh, nope. But, um, so, you know, like a little, like a little bit of fear, I guess, uh, moving to the city, which all the things that I just said not to do, uh, I've probably done all of those <laughs> when I live there. Um, don't know. It's those life. Those, don't do those things as a tourist. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, let's see what else. Um, Positive culture shocks, the food, oh my God, is amazing. Uh, I mean, literally the best food I've ever had. Um, you can walk, you can close your eyes, spin in a circle, and whatever direction you're facing, if you had to walk into that restaurant, chances are that it's like at least an eight out of 10 anywhere else in the, in the country. Um, I tell that to uh, when I talk to tourists and they ask me, where's the best pole boy, the best gumbo, the, the usual questions you get from yeah. tourists. It's uh, honestly, I was like, just follow your nose. I'm like, whatever neighborhood yep. you're in, you're going to yep. find a, an awesome po' boy and oh, an yeah. awesome meal wherever you yep. go. Yep. We, don't, we don't have a lot of mediocre food here. It's yeah. pretty yeah. great. And yeah. another, uh, I mean, not necessarily culture shock, but uh, excitement was, was the music. I mean, having some of the most talented, amazing artists play every single week mm-hmm. in a tiny club, like DBA or the Maple Leaf or sure. Chicky Wawa and – just seeing John Cleary by himself there, um, go go on a ham on a piano and singing an amazing R and B and soul song. I mean, it's it's amazing. Uh, yeah. The funny thing is, uh, my first concert I went to when I got to New Orleans, uh, I think it was Revivalist at Tipitinas. Um, and you know, advertised time was eight o'clock. Um, so in Orlando, that means if I go to an eight o'clock show, it probably starts at eight eight thirty. I know where this is going. <laughs> This concert didn't start until 10.30. 10.30, so yep. I was, I was punctual. I was there right at 8. And that's early, by the way. <laughs> that's early. That's I was early. punctual. Got there right at 8. Um, opening band didn't go until 10.30. Another opening band. <laughs> and then revivals were on by like 12.30. And <laughs> no one says no curfew. So this concert went way past 2 a.m. Of course. Um, and one of the first uh, shows we did at House of Blues was uh, Snoop Dogg uh, during Super Bowl weekend. And that show didn't even start until 3 a.m. Uh, <laughs> it just shows you, like, curfews, whatever. <laughs> like, uh, things don't close there. <laughs> no. No, I know for jazz and for maybe some of your students and uh, your colleagues who maybe have never visited New Orleans before, best time to come in terms of music, I think, and I, want, I need your opinion on this, too. Mm-hmm. I always say jazz fest, voodoo fest. Those are the oh, big yeah. festivals. Oh, but yeah. but you're, you better be digging in your pocket. To, yeah. to pay for those tickets, especially those Jazz one, Fest. Those are one of the best times to come um, if you're on a budget. French Quarter Fest. Yes. That's what I was going to say. That's such Boom. an awesome local underrated festival. Everything, all the shows are free. You have hundreds of shows going on. Um, it's such a fun festival. Uh, speaking of New Orleans, for those of you watching on YouTube, this is my, my coaster. It's oh, yeah. A, it's a fleur de lis. 
uh, with the map of New Orleans. <laughs> I got the uh, I got a collection of these because you know how cool our um oh yeah our water drains are. Yeah, that's cool. Oh, yeah, I got that. I need to get some of those too. Yeah, I love those. Um, dude, that's freaking cool, man. And again, anybody coming to New Orleans, you want to go to all of the club, the small club shows after the festivals are over. Yeah, so that's the other cool thing too is if you want to do Jazz Fest on a budget, right? You can buy single day tickets. So buy a single day ticket for whatever day you really want to go to, but then go for the after shows because uh, the festival is over at 7.30. Yes. The real Jazz Fest, I, yes. I say, begins at 10.30 at night and 2 a.m. because uh, there's show, every club will have a show at 10.30 and every venue or club will have another show at 2 or 2.30 a.m. So really, you can see live music from you can bounce around ten o'clock at night until till sunrise. sunrise. Yeah, and all different kinds of amazing shows, killer lineups. Heck, um, one of the shows I went to, what we had at House of Blues, was was slightly stupid, but mm. with Trumbun Shorty as a special guest, with Jeez. Ivan Neville as a special guest, with you know, like you name it, like all, New Orleans All Stars were special guests uh, on a slightly stupid set, and then um, some of the artists that are playing Jazz Fest. Technically, they can't play because they have a radius clause. Mm -hmm. But if Foo Fighters is playing Jazz Fest, I guarantee you either the Foo Fighters are showing up in the tiniest club uh, in New Orleans afterwards to play a surprise show, or let's say Trump on Shorty's doing a show at House of Blues, Dave Grohl might just walk in and jump in on Trump on Shorty's set. Something else I wanted to say, there's always going to be guest musicians during those weekends. Oh, yeah. Because so many bands and musicians are integrating and, yeah. and, and mixing. So it's a finest, wild time, man. Most amazing lineups I've, I've ever seen. It's so it. awesome. And so I kind of, oh yeah, of course, especially down Frenchman Street because you're yeah. gonna see everything from jazz to reggae to hip hop to rock mm -hmm. to blues. I mean, it's yeah. all in that one. It's all in that one little um, block there. Yeah. It's an amazing. That's why you think I haven't left yet. Um, <laughs> yeah. Wait, wait um, we want to go back. <laughs> I know. So House of Blues wise, mm -hmm. you were there for how long? I was also two years, exactly two, two years. years, exactly yeah, two years. On the dot. Thanksgiving 2012 to Thanksgiving 2014. That's right. I remember that. Um, what, what was your number one show, your favorite show, the one that hits close to home at the House of Blues that you booked? My favorite show that I booked. Um, the two coolest shows I booked. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this to stall to think of my favorite. Uh, sure. The two coolest shows I booked was 1975 uh, hmm. in the main room. Um, and it was a rapper called Future uh, that played in the main room. Because uh, those are the two first two shows I got to book in the main room. Mm -hmm. And they both sold out in advance. So that was kind of a nice accomplishment. Uh, coolest show I booked there. Man, it's like saying which one's your favorite kid. <laughs> well, I only have one kid, so Ollie's my favorite kid. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, Good choice. <laughs> um, you know what? I, so not maybe necessarily my, my favorite. Another cool one. Uh, yesterday we were watching that that. that uh, one world concert whatever it was and oh, yeah. uh you know keith urban was on that mm -hmm. and i was like oh yeah i remember when keith urban played the parish uh, that was kind of freaking cool like mm. keith urban playing in 370 person uh club um yeah. so that was a cool show but my favorite which one stands out the most man there's so many good ones because yeah. i remember the first time you and i started to actually work together yeah. it actually wasn't on a podcast it was through my radio station yeah yeah. At the time, and I was hosting the uh, the local rock show on oh, Sunday wow. nights, and um, I was the one pretty much in charge of talking to the bands, the managers, and getting every and everybody's music <clears throat> on the air. And I had complete control over what I played and who I talked to, which was uh, amazing. Right. Uh, and then luckily, that's how you and I got to kind of work together on a lot of those um, those little rocks, those local showcases, which was mm -hmm. a, a really good time. Yeah. Um, and again, a really fun experience too, by the way. Yeah. Uh, those were some really, really cool, fun nights for me. You know, I, I have three shows I mentioned, and they're not necessarily so. I, I mentioned the cool ones, right? Uh, 1975, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Keith Urban and Future. But my favorite shows I've booked were one was um, Jason Isbell. Uh, so amazing, mm -hmm. He's so freaking talented, puts on an amazing show. Then, not try not not saying this to gain favor with the locals but the nola rocks were some of my favorite shows because mm. i knew everyone that came to those shows i know the artist uh that was fun putting that series together but then we did also this series um but it was a shout out to my buddy blake uh blake owens or uh, he goes by by john doe these days no he goes by by og 
what's his oh man his rap name he was OG Blake Owens or something like that but anyways um, we came up with this concept of hosting a monthly hip hop show uh, mm-hmm. like a showcase where we had six rappers on each show um, they would all sell tickets it was a contest um, not just so to qualify for the contest you had to sell at least 25k so mm-hmm. um, once you sold 25 you qualify uh, and then you were judged on performance so yes it was slightly based on a on being able to sell 25 tickets but most of those battle of bands type things is basically whoever sells the most tickets wins mm-hmm. and we capped it at 25 you only had to sell 25 not more um you actually got paid off of those tickets and then we picked two winners out of every night um and this was a um six month series so after five months we had 10 winners and then we did a big showcase in the big room um and we we'll bring in the headliner mm-hmm. um nah, i forget the name of the guy but we brought in this rapper from from houston uh who was like a really big deal around the time mm-hmm. and all those artists that got to open for this this rapper from new orleans um from, from houston which was awesome because not only did we do something to build the local hip-hop scene um they were playing in front of an audience because they all sold 25 tickets so you had 150 people there uh so all those shows had an audience um it was in the Paris, so it felt great in that small 300-person club. I love that and, room. And then they got to open for a national act if they actually did a good job um, mm-hmm. with it, which most of them did. And that was so fun because that series lasted. We start, so I started in Thanksgiving mm-hmm. of 2012. The first one was uh, just four months after I started uh, in February. And that series lasted until I left. Um, oh, cool. And Blake, to this day, still, still yeah. does showcases and shows at house of blues so that's awesome i I love that one because it's something i built from scratch to create content for my venue um and it's something that kind of supported and built up the scene over there um Mm -hmm. and i got to connect with a lot of local artists so that was one of my favorites let's talk about doing some of those local showcases that might help out some um some students and some some newbies just getting into the business um when because i remember when i took over the local show on the radio side of it Mm -hmm. and i started I started to program the show based on who was playing the showcase, that upcoming showcase. Mm -hmm. So I would put a segment in the middle of the show that had four songs Mm -hmm. back to back to back to back. Mm -hmm. And those were the four bands that were playing Mm -hmm. at the showcase. What I started noticing after a while, and this is what I wanted to pick your brain about the bands that I was playing uh, eventually matched the same bands that were playing on the showcase, regardless if we spoke about those bands playing on the radio show or playing at the showcase right that's awesome was there any sort of discussion going on like you guys listening to the show or just are we all just reaching out to bands going let's let's book these bands that he's playing on the show uh at first for sure at first okay yeah because I, I didn't know how y'all did it on y'all end honestly so i just moved to new orleans like one i had to figure out what the local scene is so yeah of course you're looking at the local radio station plays and it has like a segment where they play local music um so that was one of the things I researched and I've also researched past showcases we've done and see, look, looked at who sold the most tickets uh, or who had some of the best fans. Mm-hmm. And then after doing a few of those, so for those of you like listening, um, if you guys have the House of Blues in your city, uh, there's this thing we call filler nights, right? So the rule at House of Blues, you can never have a Friday or Saturday night that's not booked. Um, so we have to book those open dates. And in the summer, there's a lot. Um, there's a few in the fall, a few in the spring, but very rare. Um, and then a couple in December again. Um, but we either will f- uh, fill those dates with a, a tribute band or a local showcase. Um, so in the summer, we had quite a lot of those. Um, mm-hmm. And so I looked at past local showcases. So, so the, the thing is, if you have a house of blues in your city, you probably have a Houston Rocks and Orlando Rocks, a Dallas Rocks and yeah. Um, LA rocks and so on. Um, Insert city rocks. <laughs> yeah. So whenever you know the concert season is slow, uh, the touring season, you know that that's a good time to reach out to your local house of blues and try to get on one of these local showcases. Um, like a little lesson there. Um, mm-hmm. And then you basically give out tons of free tickets, like the hospitals will give you. Um, at our venue, we gave them a thousand apiece. Uh, okay. At the bigger house of blues, I know in Orlando, they give you two thousand. Uh, and you pass those out, and you get paid a dollar for every ticket that comes mm-hmm. back from the ones that you passed out. Um, so you can make some good money and you can oh, play yeah. House of Blues on a big stage and it's, it's just a cool thing to do. Um, so I look, find most of the bands based on past, uh, based on what you were playing. But after you do a few, um, you really get to know the bands mm-hmm. and the bands start 
suggesting other artists that they would love to bring to House of Blues or coming up with ideas for lineups. So my buddy Orlando, like a friend Orlando, uh, he was in, in a couple of bands uh, back mm-hmm. then. And um, he actually put a, he had a lot of the lineups for me uh, because he's really knew the local scene very well. Yeah. Um, and it helps out because, you know, the, the lesson too is the easiest way to book a show as a local artist, not just if you're trying to play House of Blues where you look at the club, if you bring a full lineup to the, the, the buyer at the club or the booker at the club, um, like full lineups, so you and three other artists or if it's a hip hop show, like basically bring the full lineup to where the venue doesn't have to do any work, right? Mm-hmm. And it's not because the venues are lazy. They're, I was getting 200, 300 emails a day, um, booking mostly national acts. And I was not only a buyer from my room, I was also an assistant to Sonny for his room. So I was doing all his contracts, all his offers, placing all his holds, um, because I was busy and I couldn't just answer every email. So if someone came to me with a full lineup and I knew the person or I was confident in the lineup, I would book it immediately because the work was done. Like mm-hmm. a lot of times local bands will try to book at a venue and then expect the venue to find the other locals to open. And that's a lot of work. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause now I have to find bands that want to play with you um, that don't, may not know you. Uh, and it's so much easier to um, bring the full lineup because you already know all the bands want to play with you. Uh, so that's one of the fastest ways to get booked for a show yeah. if you're local. Yeah. So that's, that's a good lesson right there. If you're getting into the business, uh, and if you're a talent buyer, regardless of what you are, really hook up with a local radio station, hook up with a local show, pay attention to what they're playing, yep. see what's trending on that end, and that could yeah. kind of help you out, help you out at the venue. Because yeah. my whole thing, two, yeah, sorry, I didn't say I had two okay. favorite shows. So the other one I want to give a shout out to, um, I don't know if they're listening to this at all, but uh, all my buddies from that were in the Scorsese's. It better um, be. They're a really amazing like ska rock band yep. from, Orlando, uh, from New Orleans, and. You can't get good friends with them. They played a couple of those showcases where they're big enough to where they could play for a lot more than a dollar mm-hmm. per ticket. Um, but they end up doing their CD release party in the big room at House of Blues. They got these cool custom that was fun. for it. And that was just really fun to develop a relationship like over a year with an artist and someone that could have played, you know, any club in the city at the time uh, wanted to do it at House of Blues, which, you know, Let's be real. It's Live Nation, so it is the most expensive venue in town. Like, it's gonna be more expensive than doing a show at Tepatinas or yeah. something. And the fact that they wanted to do it with with me at House of Blues was was special because mm-hmm. it shows that again that relationships or a lot of times are more important than the amount of money you can make. Yeah, it's about the whole experience and trying to work with people you want to work yeah. with. Yeah, it's very important. Um, what sucks because all that fun stuff eventually uh, led to you leaving HOB. I know. I know. So what actually, so you left because from what I remember, you and I having those talks, those drunken talks, um, you left because you were kind of just tired of it. You want to do your own, your own promoting, right? Your own thing. No, the main reason I left is uh, family. Uh, Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, So again, the first time I left home, um, I've, I um, went through a lot of, self therapy and meditation uh mm-hmm. and and therapy now but i try to not be someone that lives in regret um but let's be real i really regretted that decision for years like mm-hmm. years uh, probably even last year i still really regretted leaving um hmm. sunny my boss at the time when when we had talks about me leaving for for months before i ever like pulled the trigger uh but um Last the last time when I told Sonny, this is it. I just missed, you know, like silly things. I missed watching the World Cup with my dad, uh, because I live here. Like I watched every World Cup final up until the year Germany won uh, with my dad. Um, so like, you know, as silly as it may sound, I feel like family. That's the all most important thing. stuff, though. Yeah, family is the most important thing, and the fact that not only did I miss which watching the World Cup final with my dad. Our team won, like Germany won. And when's that going to happen again? The last time they won the World Cup. Before oh, that can happen any World Cup with them. Ah, okay, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm lucky that we have a good squad. Yes, right? yes, whatever. yes, yes, but, yes. But, you know, it was 16 years before that, yeah. 1990. And before that was another 16 years. So, uh, you know. And, yes, Germans are pessimistic about their team. So, like, some of us think, like, will they ever win again? Uh, 
after they probably they will <laughs> many times <laughs> but um it was just like really disappointing and heartbreaking not sharing that experience with my family yeah and, yeah and it, i know was that with you when i watched that i was with orlando uh jean um maybe you met me up afterwards but yeah, we met up afterwards. Yeah, but we're at this 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 bar it was so much. This German bar was so much fun, but you know, didn't have my family there, and yeah, having to share it over the phone, uh, especially the way they won. Shoot, if you're a soccer fan, yeah, you remember that? It was amazing. The final, the the last minute goal. Whew, what a just beauty. beautiful. It was beautiful. <laughs> yeah, but um, it's moments like that, like missing that, missing anniversaries, missing birthdays, um. So your mom's your mom's life. potato salad. I miss your mom's potato <laughs> mom's salad potato like salad. every <laughs> fucking day. <laughs> and um, you know, it's got, it's got me really homesick. And I decided that I wanted to leave. Um, there was no rush. Like I didn't have mm. a deadline. Like I need to be out by this date. So Sonny said, "Fine, but you can't leave until I found a really good replacement that I feel confident in." And I said, "That's fair." So, oh, that's a trick. So, yeah, <laughs> that's a trick. <laughs> that was July uh, of. He was trying to get you to stay. <laughs> yeah, that was July of 2014, and I ended up leaving Thanksgiving of 2014. Yeah, so yeah. it was like a four months notice, and then during that time was like maybe the you know like the first time I really, really let go in New Orleans and really just got to enjoy the city. Uh, that's when. Like we met pretty much the minute I moved to New Orleans, but yeah, like we didn't really get tight and really close friends until that time period, um, from July 2014 to November 2014. Because we, um, we we worked a ton on my end from the radio and on, on your end with the uh, at the venue. It was yeah, a lot of work. Yeah, um, but that's like when we started hanging out more. I all of a sudden start, started building tighter friendships with others because I wasn't cooped up in researching the next band, going to another show because I had to go or wanted to go to shows to mm -hmm. see how people are performing at other venues. Uh, and I kind of just like really let go and really enjoy the city, build stronger friendships, and now build the most amazing friendship ever with, you know, nothing against you, Jason, I'm sorry, but I met, <laughs> I met Alicia during that time. And, you know, that's the, my, my wife now, and we yeah. have a baby and the most amazing person I ever met. Yeah. And I actually ended up staying for another year in New Orleans after Ooh, buddy. quote unquote quit uh, <laughs> and just freelanced. That was rough. Whole year. That was so rough. <laughs> <laughs> freelanced and built my own business for a year. Uh, uh, remember that um that was the adult swim show that we worked? <laughs> oh my god, it. yes. So miserable. <laughs> oh, that was <laughs> a fucking hellscape. <laughs> that was a hellscape, sir. Yeah. That was terrible. So we're all these random But you know stuff. what? Hold on. Quickly just tell that that gig because honestly the reason I, I want to bring that up. Um, is because you, you cut anybody working in entertainment in this related field, radio, or give it whatever it is, you kind of have to spread yourself a little bit and just take yeah. different gigs that you, that you oh, can yeah. take, especially Before if it's everything. something within your industry, cause you never know what it'll right. lead to. Well, so even then with the experience I already had, right. It was 2014 at that point, I already had eight years experience. I booked Giles Gambino. I've managed artists. Um, I was managing artists at the time. Emily Cop was going to be on the podcast. One yeah. of my clients at the time. Um, I done a lot of cool shit, but I know how the business works and immediately jumped in and started grinding, taking on every little show or event that I could work. And mm -hmm. that was one of the events that I found. I sent it to you. Hey, you want to work this event with me? And it was kind of a big event but it was very it was slim staff uh, on their end and extremely disorganized and jason and i just want to shoot each other the entire time but you know sometimes you're gonna have to work those kinds of events and just by having a good attitude and, and out and about. big learning experience from a gig like that this goes for any gig especially in, in audio entertainment what have you live events you do not work past the time that you were slotted to work unless you were getting paid yes. overtime. Unless and we ran into this, we ran into this issue at this particular yeah, adult swim gig. Think we're getting paid until like 10 o'clock and ended up staying like three or four hours later. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's miserable. <laughs> to the point to where we actually had to go to the production manager and say, Hey, listen, we are not supposed to be here this long. We're out. Yeah. We're out. yeah we and then left. that was it. Cause they weren't paid. We left. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lesson kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but during that time, so you meet Alicia, uh, struggling through, just trying to get get as many gigs as you can on your own. 
uh, what was the final straw that said, okay, it's, it's time to, it's time to head back home. Uh, there wasn't a final straw. Um, or a series a, of things. I got a job offer. Um, that's what brought me back. So yeah. um, while I'm gigging and doing all this stuff, a friend of mine was, well, again, Anna Arena, the girl uh, that I trained uh, for free for music business lessons. Mm -hmm. uh, she used to teach at Full Sail. And now I was te at the time I was teaching at LA Film School. And Anna was like, you know, um, I know that gigging and doing all these cool things you're doing um, are great and all. But it's tough because you don't have a steady paycheck. Um, you should really go think about teaching at Full Sail because uh, not only do you have a steady paycheck, um, you can teach, but you also have tons of free time to work on other projects, manage your artists, uh, work shows, and stuff like that. And at the time, I was like, "Me teach? Like, I'm in my early 30s. What do these students want to learn from me?" Um, and I used to guest speak in her classes before that. Mm -hmm. She's like, "Are you kidding?" Every time you come and speak in my classes, you're their favorite guest speaker. And, you know, like me having very low self-confidence and like, really? Like me? Like I'm their favorite teacher or their favorite guest speaker. Um, so I screwed it. So I screwed it. So in December of 2015, I moved back to Orlando to work full time to work at uh, Full Sail and, and teach for the first time. What was uh, the biggest challenge you had going into teaching? The thing that you were probably scared of the most, was it, was it speaking in front of a, of a, cl of a class? Give an instruction? Um, yeah, I guess teaching in front of the class and being relevant, like teaching stuff that students want to learn um, and creating like a curriculum for an entire semester. And I think the semesters there are short, they're like one month semesters, but teaching, like putting a curriculum together um, may have been maybe the scariest thing. And mm -hmm. also I couldn't teach right away because um, I only had a bachelor's degree. Um, so. I was one of the, the instructors that had the most experience in the business, but I couldn't teach my own class because I didn't have a master's degree. Um, so I had to get a master's degree while teaching. Um, so I got to work in my class, but I also had to do a master's degree mm -hmm. at the same time while trying to get Alicia to move to, to Florida, which she did. And then while also planning a wedding and doing all these little side gigs and starting a podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, what would you say like the biggest challenge was when you actually started teaching classes was like, let's say the first day you have, you have a class introducing yourself, you're explaining curriculum, what we're going to, you know, what you're going to be doing throughout that, those early stages, what was like the number one thing that you felt you had to work on the most that maybe you didn't feel confident about? You know what? Honestly, um, I very quickly just by guest speaking, uh, fell in love with teaching. Mm -hmm. I don't, think any of my challenges were internal um mm -hmm. it seemed very easy for me um to teach once i got in the swing of things um the biggest challenge were outside factors uh, alicia was living in south florida at the time mm -hmm. um, three hours away really maybe about three and a half hours away so every week um when the school week was over i would drive to south florida and then back early on back. monday um while still booking shows while doing a podcast while uh, managing artists. So I think the biggest challenge was just the workload I had yeah. to, to try to, I guess, stay afloat because doing that drive every week mm -hmm. had a huge additional expense that I didn't need to have if I yeah. just lived in, in Orlando. Uh, so yeah. I think that was the main challenge. I think teaching itself was, was and is awesome. Like I love teaching, which is why we launched the Academy. Um, yeah, I know. I really enjoyed teaching in a live class uh, with actual students there and engaging with the students. I've made mm -hmm. the classes always very interactive. Like, if you're going to come to my class, you are going to be participating. Um, oh, yeah. And it was just really inspiring to see how much the students, like, enjoyed the class, mm -hmm. um, but also, like, to see what some of the students have done, like, since, you know, leaving the class. Um, I wanted to ask you this when it comes to talking to your classes because we hadn't brought this up yet. Uh, did you have any issues with your Tourette syndrome when it came to teaching? Um, at that time, not so much. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know if you, like, anyone has listened to the beginning of the podcast, like from episode one. Um, mm -hmm. I have this tick now that I do all the time. It's like a noise vocal tick. Um, Jason calls it jazz. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, I have this, like, this vocal noise tick that I have now. Um, you know, when Tourette's, like, ticks come and go all the time. Um, 
and this tick didn't start until I started with AEG. So I call it my, my AEG tick. Um, so maybe, maybe when I leave AEG one day, that tick different will go ticks. away. <laughs> different level of ticks. Yeah, but I never had a vocal tick. I only had like, um, and that's maybe like my biggest struggle, like public speaking or even yeah, doing yeah. things like this or even doing video. Um, I get very self-conscious about my ticks, um, mm -hmm. which like, you know, like my, my most common ones is like blinking. Um, sometimes I like wiggle my jaw a little bit. I'll do these shoulder ticks here and there and sometimes. Uh, but that it is what it is with those. The noise tick is like what really bothers me a lot. Uh, it bothers me in, in conversations, um, especially when it's like something that's a total stranger. I, I get self-conscious about it being, you know, you can even hear it in the recordings of the podcast. You can hear it on the recordings of my YouTube videos. And now when I speak publicly, you know, um, it bothers me then. So like, I've been thinking lately, do I want to start off with like a Tourette's joke or something to let the kids know, hey, sure, hey, nothing's wrong with me. I just got Tourette's syndrome. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm not on drugs, which I've gotten a lot, especially in the music industry. Um, people think I'm on drugs. Um, and um, so the other day I spoke at, at Rollins College and like it was the same week that Billie Eilish had just played at an Amway Center. And I love that she's around and that she has Tourette's. Mm -hmm. um, ho hopefully she knows that she has Tourette's. But um, the way I got to connect with students immediately is uh, I kind of started off the presentation with who here is a Billie Eilish fan? And pretty much the entire class raised their hand because now mm -hmm. today's world, most college students are Billie Eilish fans. So I was like, well, Billie Eilish is my Tourette sister. So if you see me making any ticks or any or, or making any noises or see any ticks, uh, nothing's wrong with me. I just have Tourette syndrome. Uh, it's something I wish I used as as an advantage in high school uh, to curse out kids <laughs> and blame it on the Tourette's. Yeah, I wanted to get to that. Did you have to deal with that kind of shit as a kid growing up? Oh yeah, um, yeah I'm sure. I'm sure. I got not so much in high school anymore um, because I became the, the bigger, stronger kid and and I guess uh, student athlete. But yeah, throughout elementary school, middle school, I mean freshman year of high school, like. I got bullied like hardcore. Um, one for the Tourette's and two for being overweight. Right. Mm. So one of the things that I got called as the the big fat kid that blinks so much, um, or, or twitch or blinky, or what, mm. whatever, like all kinds of words. Um, I get picked on constantly for, yeah, for having Tourette's. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but is that something that still kind of sticks with you today, or you have you just sort of? Because you say you use it with with humor now, and I think humor is the best way to deal with motion oh, yeah. anyway. Um. um I get better. I'm getting better yeah. at it. You know, like, um, I think those things that happened back then, um, not like an effect me day to day. Um, mm. but like certain things that I struggle with sometimes like anxiety and depression are probably linked to those experience when I was younger. Um, and it's rare where like in the business, someone says something. Um, there's one show I did. I'm, I'm kind of tempted to throw them under the bus <laughs> oh I, the one that i'm thinking of maybe that you know? yeah yeah <laughs> go ahead fucking so, tell it so there's this artist name well i just said the artist name right but this artist artist had a tour manager uh his name's carlos you know it goes by narlos on on twitter uh mm -hmm. still there but um so it was it was kind of a challenging venue of a challenging day yes i mean you know what i don't make excuses for him he was a little frustrated i was frustrated um but then with tourettes like the more like stress is a trigger, um, lack of sleep is a trigger, um, um, long days are a trigger, right? So as a production manager, I'm in the perfect job. Uh, lack of sleep, long days, high stress. Your stress. Right? <laughs> so everything is awful for, for my Tourette's for the job I'm currently in. And towards the end of the night, I'm going in the saddle with the artist and or with the tour manager. And he asked me if I'm on drugs. Uh, I think he's asked me if I'm taking Coke or something. And I'm like, no, dude. Um, I was like, what makes you think that? And then he starts mocking and imitating my tics mm. and uh, basically making fun of them. And I just kind of stopped. And I was like, dude, I have Tourette's syndrome. You can't control that. And um, he didn't even apologize. He's like, calm for a second. And then he got mad and just started cursing me out about the settlement and of course how much of an awful day he had and that's the one and only time i ever walked out of a settlement and 
basically told him, F you, I'm not settling shit with you. Uh, I'm out. Looted over email. We'll let my, my town buyer and your agent deal with it. I'm done talking to you. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever dealt with that before with, with managers or anything? Or is that your only, your only instance? Your only experience in the industry. Wow. Um, well, that's a pretty good record. Now being 16 years in it. Uh, oh, yeah. That's a good record. Negative experience regarding like my, my two records. Yeah. Other people like have said things. Um, like, I don't know, like, it's funny, not funny, right? But once I was at a after party of Hangout Fest and some dude came up to me and said, man, what kind of drugs are you on? Do you have any more? <laughs> <laughs> you should tell him, yes, I was born with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I was like, man, the shit I'm on, you can't get. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to be born with this stuff, son. <laughs> yeah. This stuff doesn't even go away. It just stays in your system all the time. <laughs> yeah. I love that. I got to say this because, like, I know when we started the podcast, that was, like, one of your um, your original – I don't know if you were um, really worried about it, but it's something you definitely like brought to my attention pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, was that how you were going to handle the Tourette's thing? Yeah. And my only thing was just like, fuck it. It's you just, yeah. it's in there. I mean, you know, like that's the delay of many things. That's why it's taking me so long to launch the Academy. It's why it's taking me so long to, to do video for yeah. the podcast is why it's taking me so long to do videos in general. Uh, but it's one of the reasons why you never see me like do these selfie educational things on Instagram. That's why I just post graphics. Mm -hmm. um, that's my threats. And yeah, you know, like in a way it's held me back, but in, in another way, I the advantage of it. Um, everything that I teach and everything I share, I feel is very pure and from a good place. Yeah. Um, like I'm not doing it about me. Um, there's other people in my, in my space or in, um, in the teaching world uh, or just like in the influencer world where it's all about them and they have no problem talking about their accolades where yeah. it's taken a hundred episodes to me finally talking about me and my accolades. And um, I just want to teach, you know, I just want to share. I just want to try to yeah, yeah. make a difference. I think that's part of maybe the superpower that Tourette's has created. It's made me more, uh, sensitive and mindful to others yeah. and maybe, maybe more humble. Um, and it's also, I learned that like teaching, like doing this podcast, doing the YouTube videos and stuff. It's at the end of the day, it's not about me. It's about the information that I'm sharing with others, right? I'm sharing my experience. I'm sharing uh, really great information that has helped many artists and that helped many mm -hmm. people on the business side. And that matters more than me being self-conscious about my Tourette's. Uh, yep. Like it's making a difference. And in a way it should be maybe even more empowering, right? I have this, this stupid annoying tick that drives me crazy. And I don't know how it makes the listeners feel, but um, I'd like the, the fact that I'm willing and able to put myself out there like that. And you know, the more this podcast grows, the higher risks of these, these stupid cyber bullies and keyboard warriors uh, is gonna get, right? Um, yeah. It hasn't happened yet. Uh, thank God we have a great audience and only smart, intelligent people who have seen the videos and the content. But, you know, that's another thing I worry about. Um, if this podcast gets to five, ten thousand listeners a, a week, one day, um, will there be, will that, will that that be a thing that happens? Um, yeah. And hopefully that, by then I'm mentally strong enough to, to deal with that. Can I tell you something pretty cool about the Tourette's that I yeah. think? Yeah. I don't know if anybody's ever said something cool about Tourette's before, because <laughs> usually it's always the opposite. Somebody's always right. bullying about Tourette's. Um, when the first time, so as an audio producer, when I'm actually looking at audio, mm -hmm. your Tourette's, dude, it's almost on time <laughs> after another, and it's very percussive. It actually <laughs> looks like percussion. It's got a, it has an attack at the beginning, and it looks like a hi-hat or a snare drum. <laughs> So for any hip hop artists out there, anybody who samples, uh, maybe sample Chris's use, Tourette's. Use my ticks as a And you could use his ticks as a fucking hi-hat. That would sound cool <laughs> as hell. I'm just saying. That's just an idea. Because I think it's, it's, it's an instrument, dude. The voice now, is an instrument, and it's part of your instrument. I know. Technically, for a sample, you can sample. I don't know what the exact time is um, off the top of my head, but mm, a few seconds you can sample yeah, off of a song. Two, three, maybe. So one of my ticks is obviously maybe just milliseconds, but if you use my tick, <laughs> I fucking get copyright. Proper. Song, Proper. Royalties. <laughs> Property of making it with Chris. Tra trademarked. <laughs> That's right. That's right.
if Jay Z ever uses a sample of you in your ticks, <laughs> that shit needs to, yes <laughs> needs to be needs needs to be properly given the credit. Um, when it came to the podcast though, like I was pretty psyched when you first mentioned it. What was the uh, I'm trying to think? What was the original idea that you had? Like, what was the mission at the very very beginning? Was it to blend in your students at Full Sail mm -hmm. with music business students across the world, across the country, yeah, and um, people getting in. The original original mission was a little more broad, right? So, I, I mean, as you know, I listen to tons of podcasts. Um, of course, I go on long walks, listen to podcasts. I go on long car rides from show to show, listen to podcasts. And you and I have always talked about starting a podcast. Yep. And the original mission was, one, to create a resource for students that I wish existed um, because I feel like that this resource wasn't as available back then. There's more music business podcasts and good blogs mm -hmm. out there now, but back then I feel like it didn't exist as much. I couldn't like draw good information for my classes, like outside of like the books we're using um, for, for the students. But um, the first format, because I didn't know where it was gonna go, and that's kind of a good lesson. Um, I should have always known it was gonna go music. Um, I made it very broad. Uh, we wanted to do all entertainment. We even talked about like, um, interviewing video game designers and gamers and stuff, but it, because of who the audience is, because of probably my, my experience, what that is, it went all music, 100% music, and uh, brought us some like marketers and stuff that we draw examples from how, what they do in the entrepreneurial world and how to apply it to music, but really outside of that, it's all music now. Um, that's who my audience is, and at the end of the day, you have to serve your audience uh, what they wanna hear. Uh, that's how you build a good, successful business. Um, mm -hmm. If I, you know, I would love to have a ton of wrestlers on here and uh, people from the wrestling world, but it's not who my audience is. My audience yeah. is music people, and that's my background. And I can serve that audience better than a wrestling audience. Um, so that's kind of why I went yeah. all music. Um, and because of what it originally was, uh, I categorized it under the education category in iTunes. So I compete with German and Spanish and French which is extremely hard to compete yeah. with because those have millions of downloads. Good luck, right? yeah. If I would have been in the music category, um, this, this podcast would be ranked every week um, mm -hmm. because I've seen what someone else, so like in the overall category, um, the main podcast rankings, uh, we were in like the top 200 a couple of times, but uh, most of the music podcasts that were like in the music category, um, like anything from, I think, below 10 was never in the top 200. So we could have been a top 20 music podcast yeah. for, for years now, but yeah. because I wanted to go wide, um, I kind of hurt myself, right? Because I wanted to go education mm -hmm. um, where I should have gone narrow, which is what I teach to build a right. powerful brand. You want to narrow your focus. And if I would have practiced back then what I teach now, um, that's, a I guess, that's a big lesson. Like just, just go all in on a very specific category. Know your focus. Yeah. Know where it is. Because I think that's, you know, it's what's kind of the idea of a podcast is teasing because you just hit record and you just kind of do whatever the hell you want to do. Right. Yeah. And especially somebody like you working in the industry that has so much experience and in various areas of it too, you kind of want to put it all together mm -hmm. because it's more for everybody in that way. Right. But then you realize eventually it's like, well, wait a minute. No, no, it's, this is for music people. Right. Yeah. You know, these are the people that's learning and, and gathering from this. Right. And then later as you, grow as a business and you have so how i always teach branding is you never really hyper focus your your um your business like the more niche you can go the better if i could i don't know if i could have a podcast for rappers that only rap about mustangs i don't know <laughs> like but like the more specific the more specific you can get the yeah, better. Yeah, yeah and then as your business grows and your team grows um that's when you can start broadening the business. So if I were to expand the podcast, at least, as long mm -hmm. as it's under the making a brand, um, yes. the next thing that really makes sense would, which I haven't even told you yet, but will be a finance podcast. Uh, mm -hmm. where we talk about money because one of the biggest struggles artists have, let's be real, biggest struggles everybody has. That's is, everybody. Is money, yeah. managing your money the right way. And if I can teach artists how to manage their money, grow their money, make their money work for them, uh, that will help them overcome most of the obstacles they have, right? Like recently I had a lot of new rappers uh, join the podcast because like 
this Instagram channel called Rap Coalition and a couple of others shared my content, um, which is great. But um, most, not most, like a lot of them are still very label focused, like trying to get a label or trying to get an investor to start their career. And it's like, you don't need that. Like you don't need mm-hmm. to chase labels. You need to chase investors. Mm-hmm. Like you can do it all on your own right now, as long as you know how to manage your finances, invest your finances. Like if I was 20 or early 20s and starting a music career, the very first thing I'll do is buy a three or four bedroom house, house, live in one of the bedrooms, rent out the other bedrooms or Airbnb the other bedrooms. And mm-hmm. then immediately money coming in. Like not only would that offset my uh, my mortgage, but now I have other money coming in that I can now spend on my music career. Yeah. So that'll be the very first thing I would, I would do. So the next logical step for the podcast, uh, at least under the making it umbrella, is a finance podcast. But maybe one day when I live in New Orleans again, or if you live in Orlando, we'll start our wrestling and soccer <laughs> podcast that we had once started. <laughs> that, that would have re- nothing to do with making it. it that would really be just for our ears only, I think. Be for our ears only. <laughs> be for our, our ears only. And an excuse for us to to drink and invest more time in the yeah. wrestling and soccer. Of course. Like, that's what we need to invest anymore. more time. Yeah. <laughs> Let's invest more time into it. Yeah. Oh, geez. <laughs> Here's one thing, because you mentioned, because uh, we're going to talk about AG in a second. I think when you were at Full Sail uh, in, originally, mm-hmm. and we started doing the podcast, I think the reason we wanted the podcast to be very broad is because Full Sail covers a very broad, mm-hmm. a broad spectrum of, of careers. Yeah. Eventually. So it could be a talk um, to other the other programs to, to yeah, photography yeah. and but now and film getting and getting into AEG it sort of narrows it down and it's music focus and yeah. that's it uh how did AEG come about um so when I was at the plaza I can mention that story a little bit we mm-hmm. developed that relationship with AEG where we brought them on full-time at the plaza um and I kind of always kept in touch with, with Ethan Levinson who, who actually should be on the podcast one day but I kind of kept in touch with him um uh, he just kind of became a friend I talked to him while I was at House of Blues, um, I talked to him when when I left House of Blues. Uh, kind of got his input and some advice from him. Um, and then I moved to South Florida, so I was living or working in Orlando, but living in South Florida in Delray Beach. And the office, the Florida office for AG, is in West Palm, which is 20 minutes outside of Delray. Um, and they were they had just lost two production managers and were like in a dire need to hire some. And kind of just messaged me on Facebook one day. Um, cause like for years I had teased them that I wanted to work for them, um, before I started at Live Nation and he reached out to me out one day out of the blue and says, Hey, um, I know back in the day you were interested in working for, for AEG. Is that something you would still be into? And I was like, hell yeah, let's do it. Um, which was a tough decision though. Right. Because, yeah. um, at that time I was, let me see, at that time I had left full sale to, to teach at FIU, but was only as an adjunct. I was yeah. managing Zach Deputy full time. Um, right. I was managing other artists in full time with through Ever Seven Management, mm-hmm. who as another person who's on the podcast, uh, Randy, who runs Ever Seven. Uh, just kind of like shout out to him. Randy is uh, an artist manager, has his own company, used to manage Creed in their prime. Mm-hmm. Um, he managed Alter Bridge, Seven Dust, Paramore, uh, amazing artist. So that's kind of like my mentor in, in the management world. Yeah. And, um, I worked for him for his company, managing artists. So I was really building like my own business at the time. Um, we had a podcast sponsor for a little while with, with Van Zugel, who's an mm-hmm. amazing company. Um, and everything was growing. But there's months where we made enough to pay all the bills. We still had some money to for, sure. for food and for fun. And there's some months where uh, Alicia was my, my sugar mom, and mm-hmm. she literally had to pay for everything. Uh, and that was tough, you know? Yeah. Um, it, it, if I was single and doing it and not and like living with my parents, it'd be easier. Um, not saying it's impossible when you're not because there's many success stories and I was doing it too for a very long time on my own, but it was hard. And yet getting a guaranteed paycheck waved in front of you for one a company you really respect and then two for like a team that you always wanted to work for um, was very tempting. It was like an opportunity yeah. I couldn't refuse. So I went back in and everything else yeah. suffered, right? I stopped. Managing all my clients, um, I the podcast. I mean, shit. I went to a few episodes a year the last two years, um, and that's why we kind of this year said, okay, let's start slow. Let's do it once a month and with, ease it in. This, this virus now, okay, now we can do. Probably could do it weekly, but <laughs> probably. I'm, but I'm uh, like, still. Let me, let me pre-record a bunch yes. of episodes so in case things start back up in the fall. At least 
I'm I'm batch recorded through the whole fall through. The Get them in the can. Um, but um, it was just a really great opportunity to work shows at a level I've never worked at. And one of the things I said when I was teaching, um, I knew when I went into teaching that I would get back into the industry full time because I was young. I'm, you know, I'm still young. I'm still in my 30s. Um, but I didn't want to teach the same stories for the next 40 years, which I love the people I've, I've taught with at all the schools I've been to, but, but you see a lot of that. Um, Cause like the teaching, you have to have a master's degree or a PhD, depending what level you teach at. Um, and let's be real, 98% of the new people in the music industry um, definitely don't have a master's or a PhD. And then probably I'll say at least 50%, maybe higher, don't even have a bachelor's degree. So the, mm people that are most qualified to teach um, can because, because you know, they're most qualified because they're experienced mm -hmm. can't teach because they're limited by the degrees they have, um, which I think is one of the downfalls in the education system, at least when it comes to our industry. Um, I, mean, I, don't, I don't even remember what the original question was, but um, so I knew I was going to get back into the industry full time. I just didn't, was waiting for the right opportunity, the right moment. And yeah. AG felt like the right thing to go into. Uh, you know, I was mostly in the club world, and that's kind of opened up a giant new spectrum of working arenas and festivals and yeah. amphitheaters. And literally, not like, yeah, I did it with a rock for hunger with no experience, um, but it was scary. Mm -hmm. Now I can go to a completely open field. Uh, like, you point out a field or a parking lot and say, I'm paying you to do a festival there, I can pull it off. Uh, which back then I didn't have that. I mean, I guess I had that confidence, but now I can do it the right way yeah. um, versus half assing and figuring it out back then. Yeah, that confidence sounded pretty good just now. Yeah. <laughs> it worked. Yeah, it worked. I wanted to, uh, quickly. I wanted to go back to um, to full sale real quick. What yeah. uh, what ended full sale? Because I remember it being. I mean, it's a teaching job. It's not easy. Uh, you're not always. You know, you're not making a lot. Right. So, you know, unfortunately, a lot of teachers don't make a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, was it mostly, mostly that financial decision? Cause I know, a, you know, you, you, you do nice with AEG mm -hmm. and, uh, was it mostly the financial decision you and Alicia, you know, wanting to get married and everything. It was, I know it was, it was the right idea, but full sale are it was too many one, factors. One that, um, the financial part, I mean, you know, make yeah. money as a teacher. Um, they had a tough year that year. So they had some, some cuts and limited mm -hmm. the raises they could give, but, uh, they're doing great now, but, yeah. um, Really, the main number one factor is Alicia lived three and a half hours away, and I had to commute every week three and a half hours, and I get I didn't get to go home and see her every single night. Um, yeah, that was the number one factor. Uh, I mean, and every phone call we had during that time was from your car. Yeah, from my car. <laughs> Everyone. <laughs> Everyone. <laughs> every every us uh, brainstorming for the podcast, whatever it was, it was from your car. All right. Yeah. <laughs> and that was it. I think it's the main reason I've made most of my tough decisions. I mean, yeah, yeah. Honestly, like. Full sale was probably my favorite job I ever had. Um, oh, cool! I, l I love teaching there. Um, yeah. Anybody from Full Sale is listening, I would go back there in a heartbeat. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, at the time, I sh she was about three and a half hours away. Um, yeah, yeah. Could I look into the future? Um, would I have not left if I know she was going to move to Winter Park one day, which yeah. is now three miles away from Full Sale? Um, I probably wouldn't have left, but it's good that I left because it's opened up so many more doors um mm. and i got so much more experience and got to learn so much more about myself and i feel like mm. had i stayed there it still would have limited to me limited me to what i i could have done outside of the school which where now i didn't besides being able to promote shows like i have no limit uh with what i'm doing yeah. as long as like it doesn't interfere with my work with ag yeah the making uh, making it academy idea originally mm -hmm. I remember you talking about it when we first started planning the podcast it's kind of grown into a whole different thing because I don't, I don't remember you mentioning that you wanted to give um, like monthly lessons and stuff. No. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what, what brought it on? What um, sparked the idea? I kind of had an idea for maybe about a year. Um, but so like in my space, like, that's funny. Whenever I say in my space, I, I think of my space, yeah. <laughs> the, the old social media platform, but my comma space yeah. in, in the, in the industry of, like that I'm in with the podcast world, um, mm -hmm. regardless whether it's music or if it were marketing, whatever, everyone that's in, in that world has a podcast and a course they sell. Um, and my original thought was like building some kind of course or courses that I would sell. Mm -hmm. um, but 
that never really sounded exciting to me and kind of what really gave me the confidence and pushed me over the edge was one like Greg Roulette uh, who's, you know, we talked about earlier but uh, another person is Derek, Derek Sivers who I just mm-hmm. recently had on the podcast and he has this kind of mindset that sometimes it's better to do the complete opposite of what everyone else is doing right so everyone in my industry is doing the courses along with their podcast and I was like you know what? I'm a teacher I develop curriculums I have been in the industry a really long time I've seen many different sides of the industry like me teaching a course like, or creating one course and selling it is kind of limiting me to what I can do um, if I do a monthly course not only can I do whatever I want with it but I can also keep it very relevant um, so the very first course we did was just now in April so this, I'll say the year in case people look at this 10 years mm-hmm. down the road but uh, in April of 2020 uh, we just did the first course which is just a couple weeks ago from, from the recording today but the first course was supposed to be kind of the foundation of what every artist needs to have to build a music career. But because of this this virus now, the COVID-19 virus, uh, I was like, let me do something that's more relevant. I'm going to teach the artists in my first lesson how they can make money with Facebook Live. That'll be the first lesson. Um, Because that's very relevant. That's very current. Um, Me developing a course about touring is is not going to help them, right? And Mm -hmm. that's the other thing. If I would have developed a course to sell, the first course I probably would have created would have been a touring course because that's most of my experience sure so if i were selling a 500 dollars touring course um who right now in t- the world we're in today with this virus would have bought a 500 dollars touring course yeah. it has zero value because they don't even know when you can tour again so by me doing these monthly lessons i can custom make them to be relevant to the industry today and utilize my work experience and teach- teaching experience to, to make it the most relevant and i actually i haven't talked to you um exactly the way i'm looking so it's kind of brainstorming my walk sure. during my walk today but the way i'm looking at this course it's 20 dollars a month for the first 20 that sign up um or the academy um for the first 20 to sign up then it's 30 dollars a month and the the academy if you're part of it it's like having if you're a musician it's like being part of an artist development program um so it's an artist development program essentially we're teaching you how to do these things versus doing it for you um and then if you're on the the business side the non-artist side um we're kind of teaching you how the business works. So we're developing you uh, in your career. So it's mm-hmm. a development program. Um, I do want to launch pretty soon, by, by, by summer, um, the B Academy, which is for artists that are making at least $2,000 a month or more. So my goal with the Making Academy is to get you to that point as fast as possible. Uh, so it's like having access to a manager, but not being able to call them your manager. Mm-hmm. If you're in the B Academy, now you can call me your manager, but I'm not your day-to-day manager. I'm not going to create social media posts for you. I'm not going to create graphics for you. We're just going to talk big picture stuff, uh, come up with a big picture game plan. And it's like, it's actually like a master class where you're part of the Academy. And I have like other plans I'm working on. Um, yeah, I guess what people I haven't talked to yet, but um, there is a art, full-on artist management, um, traditional artist management, where you just pay your 15, 20% of, yeah program after the academy that i want to uh, launch as yeah. well in partnerships with another management company so, so it's kind of uh, the vision of the academy academy what's so bizarre now dude when you think about online courses like think about back in the day when when online courses first started compared to what it is now mm-hmm. it's very customized it's almost like niche for you like whatever you want to whatever you want to progress to in your career right. you can kind of tailor it tailor that information that education to them and the cool thing too is it's a um, crazy time we're so, living in. So yeah, so you know, like I think twenty to thirty dollars a month is not a lot. I know some artists may, may think that, um, mm-hmm. but just think if you can have access to someone with with the experience I have, an actual someone that's been an actual artist manager and knows how the industry works, and it's basically like talking to a manager once a month, but just in a group setting. Uh, but yeah. you can still ask questions. I've been because I've extra time, I've been throwing in a free one hour consult. So I really know about all my artists that are a part of the academy. Um, and you know, we have a 45 minute lecture and then followed by like a 30 minute Q um, and A. If nobody asks questions, I started kind of just picking on the artists like, hey, you're working on this vlog. How is the vlog going? Tell me about your progress. And then we kind mm-hmm. of start a conversation in the group about their vlog and how they can grow and build their vlog. And mm-hmm. maybe there's someone else there that has been thinking about starting a vlog and now that conversation is getting them inspired to start that. Yeah. Uh, so that's been really cool. 
And then, you know, it's going to become, even though it's just $20 to $30 a month, it's going to become even more and more valuable down the road because imagine I've been doing this for a year and new people that sign up have access to all the archives. So after a year, you're doing, you know, two lectures a month. So mm-hmm. one artist focused, one non-artist focused, and then uh, one guest speaker or six guest speakers per year. Um, so after a year, there will be an archive of 30 videos and uh, you and I don't have access to. So like you're paying $20, a, $30, $20 to $30 a month, you not only get access to the next live lecture, but you now have access to this archive of yeah. all this content, which I can probably sell each course at a hundred bucks a piece. But yeah. um, you're getting it at thirty dollars a month. I think and it's content you can always go back to and pull up whenever you whenever you need it. Yeah. yeah. So it's the beauty of it. I think man. it's like highly. I, think, I feel like it's highly valuable. Um, you gotta really. I mean, you know me. Like I really care about wanting to make a difference in these artists' careers. Uh, the reason it's thirty dollars a month is because artists don't have a ton of money so yeah. when they're first starting out. But it's also why I want to start the B Academy, which is something a little bit more high level um, for artists already making 20 grand a year to get to the next point. You know what I'm seeing here? This goes back to you growing up in Germany and how the German school system works. <laughs> You're kind of applying that to the Making It Academy a little bit. That's one, yeah. <laughs> There's kind of some so. tears here. Yeah. But, but everyone can go to the B Academy Right. You just got to make it a certain amount. You're not of restricted. Right, right, right. Um, but, you know, you're going to pay for the B Academy more as yeah. well. But so I'm kind of helping you out by giving. But then, like you said, you have, you have the B Academy, that higher tier that can, you know. Yeah. That's really, that's cool stuff. I, there's one idea that we had about, the, about making it mm-hmm. that we still need to do. What's that? The making it convention, remember? So. Making it con. I think that's a good <laughs> realistic now next step once we can yeah. have live events. Because what would be really cool, right? So let's say the academy one day has 100 students um the first time we do the the conference the people are most likely to come are going to be the students and Mm -hmm. like imagine like being in a virtual classroom for a year connecting with all these artists like i mean uh, i have a girl that that's originally from mexico that lives in orlando i have an artist that lives in colombia a girl in savannah um an artist in jacksonville florida so imagine me like connecting virtually through all these people from literally all over the world and now once a year getting to meet them in person and, yeah. and the cool thing with these conferences is um i heard this one podcaster uh, speak about their conference and you know thinking all the people from the conference are coming there for him because he, he's the, the guy but they're really coming to meet all the people that are part of their their school their academy yeah the, all these people that have been connecting so it's gonna be really cool to see them meet in person one day yeah um, it'll, it'll happen yeah let's get over this this hump before we can we can yeah. move on to it <laughs> i'm excited for it because i remember when you mentioned that idea it's like you wanted to do it in Florida, mm-hmm. kind of a central location where everybody can meet in Orlando or something like that. Yeah. And um, two days of conferences and you wanted to have bands playing and everything. So I yeah. think that's something that could still, so- still be pulled off. People can yes. Collaborate yeah. song, song write together. Like, yeah. All, all kinds of cool things. And put a microphone and hit record and record everything. Yeah. Have it all documented, archived and uploaded. So yeah. it's good stuff. Let's, uh, let's rifle off some, um, some very making it with Chris G usuals that you do. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to take some of yours. So I'm going to, let's rifle. You mentioned a bunch of mentors throughout the show, mm-hmm. um, which is good. And um, it's a pretty hell of a crew that you had there too, in your mentors, but let's go through some books and podcasts or, or I mean, we're all quarantined right now. So you're, we're all watching a, a bunch of different shit. So feel free to rifle off just whatever you're listening to watching and whatever you recommend <laughs> to people. <laughs> so so podcasts <laughs> this giant freaking list oh my um, god how long do we have <laughs> <laughs> so so i recently wrote an article about music business podcasts people should listen to um but you know some of those are, are ari um ari herstan who's been mm-hmm. on podcast i think also three times now um he wrote his book how to make it in new music business mm-hmm. um he has a podcast now um trying to find the name as i'm speaking um that's definitely one people should listen to the Creative Juice podcast that is Circa. Um, he, his real name is Kyle Lemaire. He's been on the podcast. We had a really amazing conversation just about, like, he's, his co- podcast is very marketing focused, but on the music industry, right? So a niche of a niche. It's a music podcast, but it's all really deep marketing. And his is great. That's Creative Juice. Uh, Ari Herstand's podcast, This Graceland is fun. Uh, it's, yeah, I like that one. Yeah, yeah. Basically, the disgraceful stories of Hollywood. Um, yep. And it's mostly music focused. So it talks about like the tragedies of 
of different artists. Uh, it's really cool. Um, I'm just gonna, now I'm just going to go through it. Um, I have More Cheese and Less Whiskers, which is like a really great marketing podcast where they really dive deep into – What's it called again? Uh, more Cheese, Less Whiskers. Okay. And they really dive deep into like specific businesses and come up with creative ideas for those businesses to promote themselves. Um, of course, are you ready to drink? Uh, Gary V. <laughs> oh, <laughs> holy shit. Well, we might as well. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned Gary V. So here. This is a drinking game, right? <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> then uh, the Side Hustle School is a fun one. Um, Derek Sivers, of course, he has a podcast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I listen to his. Uh, a good friend of mine has a podcast called Keeping It Rosy, which is like a comedy, just bullshit. bullshit. That's fine. Um, not, not that it's a bullshit podcast, but there's bullshit Flow. around having fun. Free. Like Joe yeah. Rogan. Free flow. Man. Uh, uh, ben Greenfield for fitness. Um, of course, Joe Rogan, one of my podcast inspirations. Uh, Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. The Doctor's Pharmacy with Dr. Mark Hyman. The Social Media Podcast. I listen to Lewis Howes. Talk is Jericho with Mr. Chris Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Tim Ferriss. Uh, the Wellness Mama. Uh, I'm listening to a parenting podcast hmm. now. Uh, oh, there you go. The Bob Left Sets podcast is a great one. He's an historic figure in music business media. Uh, and the writer is the Stone Cold Steve Austin show. Um, <laughs> online marketing made easy with Amy Porterfield, James Altucher, Bigger Pockets uh, Real mm -hmm. Estate, uh, Bigger Pockets Money, and Ari's podcast is called New Music Business. And then uh, I'll, I'll mention one more. And Joey Diaz. Uh, I love I love Joey <laughs> Diaz. I'm a favorite. Oh, he's <laughs> hilarious. Uh, do you listen to Behind the Bastards? I do not know. Oh, dude, you have to listen to Behind the Bastards. Okay. I, it's 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 a deep dive. It's a comical deep dive on just every asshole that's ever lived. Okay. Hitler, Bin Laden. I listened to an episode the other day. I was uh, deep diving through their back catalog, and they did an entire episode on what was found on Bin Laden's hard drive. Oh yeah. And, <laughs> there's some weird shit. Just <laughs> it's Behind the Bastards is is some really good stuff. Nice. Awesome. Uh, yeah. uh, recommended. Uh, something else. Uh, did you mention books yet? You didn't mention books. Books. Oh man. Um, yes, we have video version. Give me one second. Oh God. <laughs> and this is the point where I'm supposed to fill time. <laughs> Should I beatbox beat at this box. point? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'll, I'll throw out a couple. Um, a couple of podcasts on my own, real quick, right, while you're looking them up. Right here. Oh, never mind. You got them. Uh, Jesus Christ, dude, you're gonna be a dad. <laughs> oh, cool. Um. Best, best book on leadership, uh, Developing the Leader Within You by John C. Maxwell. Okay. Ready to drink again? Crushing it from Gary Vee. Oh, <laughs> Speaking of crushing it. Here. Uh-uh. Nope. No. <laughs> Hurry up. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> then, all right. I'll, I'll leave these. Ari's book is great. Get Ari's mm -hmm. book, How to Make it a New Music Business. Um, and then two other really, really three other really important mm -hmm. books. All right, so the first one I don't, I don't have right here handy, but is known by uh, Mark Schaefer, who's been on the mm -hmm. podcast. Uh, what a brilliant marketer. What a really great book on creating consistent recurring content, um, which I know Gary Vee is like the, the preacher and the doctor of. No. Nope. <laughs> cheers. But Mark Schaefer, like, it's like someone in that world. He's just in the content marketing world and just wrote a really cool book on how to like really game plan and come up with really good ideas uh, for your content. And then mm. speaking of content, uh, Joe Polizzi, who's been on the podcast. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Content, content Inc. Inc. Okay. Uh, my favorite marketing book. It's basically the entire strategy for the making Academy and everything is inspired mm. by Joe Polizzi. Like basically following his blueprint. Have, um, uh, have you ever thought about writing a book? Uh, I don't think I've told you yet, but uh, oh, I have breaking been, news. I've been approached about writing a book right now. Get the I'm, fuck! I'm currently working on the outline for get out book. Yeah, yeah, I'll that's tell you fantastic. More, I'll tell you more details of what it is off. Well, I mean, well, let's let's say here. Cheers to that. <laughs> Cheers to that. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's awesome. Say man. more about that. Uh, and then my favorite, favorite music business book is. Also, dream podcast guest. They call me Supermensch. Mr. Oh Seth yes, Gordon. hell of a documentary. Great documentary. Even better book. Um, really, I'm gonna, I'm gonna yeah. have to check it out then. That's a must get. I, I listened to I'm the a fan audio, of his. audiobook version, and uh -huh. the second I finished the audiobook version, I wanted to restart and listen to it again. That's cool, man. How great of a storyteller Chef Gordon is. He's yeah. for those that don't know, <clears throat> Chef Gordon is the 
manager for Alice Cooper, uh, Teddy Pendergrass, um, Man I'm Blank and Gypsy Kings, so many amazing artists. Um, he had 100 artists at one point, and he, uh, he's kind of created a concept of a whole celebrity chef. Like the whole reason like why chefs now have TV shows and books and products all started with him, and he kind of tells that story in that book and in the documentary. Um, yeah. Amazing person, super down to earth, great storyteller. Um, he was on a lot of podcasts when that book came out, but it's been a while, so I think it's the right time to hit up Chef Chef Gordon for think so. a coming episode. I think so, man. And plus, I recently worked a show with Alice Cooper, so that's like, you know, that's a connection. Connection. <laughs> yeah. So the other connection to this and Alice Cooper is the uh, the Hollywood vampires. Yes. And uh, <laughs> dude, what a transition that was. You caught that, huh? <laughs> We're talking about Alice Cooper, and I went, oh, I know where we're going next. Uh, so the Hollywood vampires, you know the story. I'm not even going to say. If you don't know who it is, kids, look it up. Okay. Um, who is in your, your Hollywood vampires drinking club? Top five. Top five. Chef Gordon. Okay. Is one. Uh, of course, The Rock. <laughs> the, um, the, the, the Rock. The Rock. John. He's, a, he's a tequila guy, too. So. Tequila guy. Have, have you had uh-huh. uh, Terramana yet? No, I haven't. I'm supposed to get it today, and I didn't. Oh, uh, oh really? It'll be a trip after this yeah, podcast. Yeah, yeah. Um, but The Rock, um, Jimmy Fallon. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's fun. <laughs> um, Here's the thing. If you have Jimmy Fallon, he's going to be laughing the entire time. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. But even though it's not necessarily someone that I'm inspired by, but I feel like if you have Jim, Jimmy Fallon, you've got to have Blake Shelton. So mm-hmm. I think okay. Shep Gordon, The Rock, Jimmy Fallon, Blake Shelton. Um, I want to say Alan the Generous. <laughs> a lot of dancing and laughing in this group. I think that this group will be a I kind of dig it. Be a group full of great stories, lots of laughing and lots of lots of drinking. <laughs> yeah, I already lots have mine too. I would be drinking Terramana the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> I listened mine a long time ago. I've yeah, actually this... changed mine a few times. Yeah, my uh, my, my drinking too. club. Yeah, this was this was off the top of my head just now, but that's uh, a good. One. Yeah, this podcast is not sponsored by Terramana, but <laughs> if, if Dwayne Rock should be. wants to be on the, on the show and sponsor the show, we would, we would be open to that. We'll be well, we, this discussion. we yeah. can fit him in. We can fit him in. <laughs> we'll find the time. Um, all right, well, dude, you, you want to wrap this up? You want to keep going? I'm, I'm open, so whatever you want to do, man. I mean, how long have we been going already? Two hours? A while. Yeah. yeah. This is yeah. officially the longest episode of the podcast. Free flowing, baby. That's no, all good. Like I'm I've, happy with that. I feel like I've rambled for a long time. And nope, nope. We both no, we didn't ramble. We had a conversation. That's what it's called. Yeah. It's, um, it's like it's like when some people say, um, you know, they 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 like the Joe Rogan style podcasting. Mm-hmm. That's not a style to me. That's right. just called having a conversation. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not a, it's not a, a radio inter- interview. It's just having a conversation. Yeah. Um, what's your overall opinion on the uh, the whole making it podcast since we started? Like, what? How do you how do you feel about it? Uh, I feel great. I wish I could do it every week again. Yeah. Um, honestly, if I really could do it, if I could, I could do it twice a week. Um, yeah. But maybe something down the road in the future. Uh, yeah. It's been great. It's been, I've developed a lot of cool relationships with people. Um, mm-hmm. Like like Kevin Lyman, uh, who started Warp Tour. I got, I just, you know, randomly hit these people up now here and there and try to continue building that relationship. It's, it was cool to have him on the podcast and then actually work a Warp Tour and see how much of a beast he is uh, like he practices what he preaches like he is the hardest worker in the room uh on warp tour he's not sitting on his laptop uh throughout the entire day and, and kind of just hanging out he is on the field in the heat uh riding his bicycle around really watching the bars like the lines of the bars are moving fast enough you're gonna have kevin lyman uh right yeah. there trying to figure out why is the bars are moving faster um it was really cool to see that. Uh, it's got to meet a lot of cool people on, on the business side, but also got to meet a lot of amazing artists that have reached out to me. And it's inspiring seeing you know, the emails and the stories of um, people. And it's crazy. Like people sometimes like will listen to the podcast for months or even like a year plus before they even reach out to me. And like, yeah, we're all busy and we're all working on stuff, but if anybody has made it this far on the pod- podcast, this episode, Mm-hmm. reach out to me this, you listen to one episode and like it inspired you like hit me up um yeah of course leave a review those are always great but please like there's this is one artist that i think he's doing some really cool things right now his name's punkowski's 
in, in the academy and he left a review on the podcast like of july of last year 2019 mm -hmm. and it took him till february of, of 2020 like like was it seven months eight months later to finally hit me up and it's been cool i've done a i've been on his podcast on his instagram live podcast and did an interview with him he's part of the academy um mm -hmm. he's doing some really cool things and um i don't know i feel like he's building a really cool blueprint for what artists should be doing and it was just cool to see artists like that reach out to me as well yeah that's um, awesome it's been a lot of great artists that have hit me up and people mm -hmm. that are whether they're a part of the academy or not um it's just cool that it's, to see that his podcast actually makes a difference yeah and, you know one of the things that one of the things reasons i wanted to sometimes my battle with being in the industry is i feel like just promoting shows maybe doesn't make a big difference or impact and that's something i want to do i want to do something that makes a difference yeah. and it's cool that you know my, my history rock my history rock song and everything yeah i've worked with like the homeless and the at-risk youth and when you think of making a difference you kind of think of those types of causes but there's musicians out there and people in the music business that really want to learn this business and understand yeah. it and are led by the wrong people. And it's awesome to see that something like this, this is, that's fun that I'm passionate about is, mm -hmm. is making a difference. So yeah. yeah, I think that's one of my favorite things about the podcast. That's beautiful. That's yeah. awesome. Who's, um, who's some dream guests that you want to get on the show? Chef Gordon. Well, we uh, mentioned him. Yeah. yeah. But... The rock. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Anybody else we're missing? <laughs> Gary, Gary V. <laughs> oh, I knew I, I figured that was coming. <laughs> um, there's so many. Um, yeah, there's Kara Lewis, who is one of the she's one of the biggest agents in the, in the hip hop world. Um, mm -hmm. Historic agent. Um, she's she probably really tough to get a hold of, but uh, she'd be awesome on the podcast. Um, some A and R's would be great. Um, some maybe some people from ASCAP, BMI, um, um, CSAC, like from all the different PROs. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't have to be like just big names, you know, like if there's someone that's doing cool stuff at BMI, uh, it'd be great to talk to them, just kind of learn how BMI works and what that can do for artists. Um, mm -hmm. And really, honestly, just anyone that's doing something cool that other artists could learn off of. Um, I will say Chance the Rapper would be awesome to have um, just because he's a truly independent artist. Um, Wolfpack, uh, I don't even know of them, but they're um, kind of like in the jam world. They mm -hmm. don't even have a manager. They don't have a label. And they sold out two nights at Madison Square Garden. Um, so oh, wow. Someone like that would be kind of cool, too. Um, so yeah, some really great stories that, like, want to make a difference, but then also people that we really want to talk to as well. <laughs> Dude, it would be awesome if – I don't know if you're a fan of, uh, of uh, Fugazi or not, but they have a great story because they've been known yeah. as, like, the ultimate independent uh, punk band, mm -hmm. you know, for, for so many years. I would love to pick their brains and see just yeah. how they maneuvered an older, an older music yeah. business compared to now too, you know, yeah. as an independent band and staying, that's staying it, on top. That's, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right, man. The, the very last question, the one you asked, <laughs> you've asked 99 times. <laughs> if that make does that, does that make sense? Yes. You've asked this 99 times. Um, so for the hundredth one, I get, I get to ask it. So uh, <laughs> let's hear it, man. What's your definition of making it? My definition of making it. So, First, I got to start it with something I learned in, in a class one day. Um, it's a quick side tangent. And I was in college. There was this professor, um, man, Dr. I don't remember his name now, um, but it was a professor at UCF. He was mm -hmm. um, taught a psychology class. Uh, and it's like physiological aspects of psychology. Anyway, uh, he always said that if we combine, and he had Parkinson's, he said we figure out a way to combine both of our brains. Uh, you know Tourette's and Parkinson's. Yeah, yeah. We find the cure for both Tourette's and um, and Parkinson's. So kind of just a little shout out to him. But what he yeah. has taught me, he said, the purpose to life is having someone to love, something to do, something to look forward to, and something to give back. Um, so my kind of definition is kind of something along the lines of that, right? It's being completely having complete freedom from time uh, of your time and location. Um, uh, sometimes you got, well, let me say it first and then explain it, uh, having complete freedom of your time and location and doing something that truly is like fulfills you and inspires you completely, um, you know, mentally, physically, uh, emotionally, and being so good at it that it inspires the people that you love. Mm -hmm. That's kind of my definition of making it. Um, 
you know, and being like free of time and location is, yeah, there's financial success to that, but it doesn't need to be millions, um, just enough to where I, I don't have to go clock in and clock out every day. Yeah. Uh, so that's my freedom of time and location and being able to do things on my terms. Uh, yeah. Recording podcasts when I want to record them, teaching classes when I want to uh, teach them and being able to do that, whether it's in my, in my bedroom or sitting on the beach in Hawaii or uh, being being over at your house, I'm doing it over beers. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and we'll have many more of those too, by the way. <laughs> I'm sure we will. Uh, well, shit, man, we've made a hundred freaking episodes uh, over the last few years. Um, so without even saying his name, we don't even have to say his name. Let's just cheers anyway. <laughs> cheers to 100 episodes. Cheers to you and I. Cheers uh, mostly to you. Uh, cheers to you, Alicia, the baby the fam, everybody. Cheers to the Making It Academy. And most importantly, I think um, cheers to everybody who listens, follows us, and um, who gets something out of it because that's what uh, you wanted to do, right? Yeah. And you wanted cheers, to... Cheers to you too, man. Like, oh, well, thank you. you, you it's funny. Um, in, in music industry, they say uh, the mastering engineers um, can literally turn shit into gold. <laughs> and so many recordings I've turned over to you. <laughs> you have literally turned shit into gold. <laughs> like some of these recordings I turn over to you, I'm like, how the hell is Jason going to make this sound good? <laughs> like there's one that stands out with Dan Larson. Uh, if you listen back to that episode, you can hear a little bit of bass in, that, in the background. When I was interviewing him, I couldn't hear him. Like I was doing a sound check. Okay, the yes. Show, and right. the sound check was so loud that I couldn't hear him answering the questions. Um, so it was a very challenging uh, episode. Thankfully, he's a great speaker and loves to talk, but yeah. I, couldn't, I could barely hear a word. So it was like really tough for me to engage with him because I couldn't hear what he was saying. Um, and now if you listen back to that episode, you can't even tell that there was a sound check in the background. So <laughs> cheer, cheers to you for making nah, the show man. sound good and for being a great friend and being there from, from the get-go and being on board to help, help this grow. Where Maybe one day I can actually pay you what you're worth for the podcast. <laughs> We're getting there. Yeah. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be in our 40s by the time we get there, but that's fine. We'll get there. <laughs> that's the whole point. Uh, but no, seriously, cheers to you and everything you've accomplished so far. Um, Thanks, man. I, I know you were, you were having some apprehensions about even doing this episode because mm -hmm. uh, you weren't feeling too confident and stuff, but uh, sounding great I, to I, me, I, man. I, uh, you nailed it. I'm not, I'm not, not a fan of talking to myself. Oh, I get that. No, I, I totally get that. But um, the cool thing is you get your story out because, A, you have the experience. You have this story of yours uh, from being a childhood, being influenced by music and being bullied in high school, overcoming that, and uh, just going from step by step throughout your career in life to, to where you are now. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say that it's so weird that we're doing the 100th episode at this time because you have made it. <laughs> like the yeah. wife, the kid, great career. So. You know and, Cheers to that. And a good note to end it, end it on. Okay, yeah, yeah. Making it is every day you get to wake up and try to be a little bit better than you were yesterday. Yeah. That's making it. Just being alive, man. Live the life you love.